Good evening, I'm Carolyn Wright, Chair of the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach. And I hereby call this meeting to order at 6 o'clock p.m. on this fifth day of April 2022. Members of the public, uh, we invite all the welcome all those who are present with us in person and as always members of the public are able to observe this meeting through live streaming on vbschools.com broadcast on vbtv channel 47 and on zoom so with that madam clerk will you please announce those school board members in attendance thank you uh the members that are in school board chambers are Chairwoman Rye, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Felton, Ms. Franklin, Ms. Holtz, Ms. Hughes, Ms. Manning, Ms. Riggs, and Ms. Weems. And presently on Zoom is Ms. Owens and Vice Chair Melnick. Thank you, Madam Clerk. For the record, Mrs. Melnick is, is uh, participating remotely this evening due to health reasons and Mrs. Ms. Owens for personal reasons. Uh, so now I am this brings us to the moment of silence and uh, I'm going to be asking you to join in with me but I'm turning it over first to Mrs. Weems for some special remarks. Thank you Ms. Rye. Um, I'd like to just take a few minutes to pay tribute to Tim Jenny who sadly passed away um, yesterday. Yep, Tim Jenny was our superintendent for nine years from 1996 to 2005. I was lucky enough to work with him for three of those years. He was an amazing leader for our school system and really did change the landscape of the Virginia Beach Public Schools. Under him, we opened a full-time gifted elementary school. We opened the Advanced Technology Center. We also opened five high school academies at First Colonial, Bayside, Salem, Tallwood, and Lansdown. We opened the middle years program at Plaza and put fiber optic cable in the ground that made ours the fastest wide area network in the state. Under Dr. Jenny, we rebuilt, rebuilt or renovated 26 schools and secured the funding for both the Renaissance Academy and the Princess Anne County Training School, Union Kempsville Museum. He made sure that there was a computer lab in every school created our technology resource specialist positions, the school improvement specialists, and created the distance learning program. Dr. Jenny was a passionate visionary. As a parent and board member, I am thankful for doctors, Dr. Jenny's print he left on our school division. And I wish the best for his family and friends during this great time of loss. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Williams. So we'll proceed with our moment of silence. Please stand as you're able for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, this leads us to our student, employee, and public awards and recognition part of the evening and turning this part of the program over to uh, Mrs. Anderson. Tonight, we as a board are pleased to announce the honor and school board recognitions rep recipients for April 5th, 2022, Mrs. Holtz. This evening, we are happy to honor this evening, we are happy to honor Dr. Claire LeBlanc, who currently serves as the principal at Ocean Lakes High School. Dr. LeBlanc was recently inducted into the Virginia High School Hall of Fame for her lifetime of recognitions related to coaching girls volleyball, uh, field hockey, basketball at Green Run, Princess Anne and Frank W. Cox High Schools, the Hall of Fame dedicated to preserving the rich heritage of outstanding achievements by students and adults in sports and activities within Virginia's public high schools. Coaches are eligible after 15 years of experience <coughs> or upon retirement and are judged on the merits of their accomplishments at the high school level. 
Dr. LeBlanc is one of the rare coaches in VHSL history to lead multiple teams to the state finals along with the district and region titles at several schools and in several sports over a 22-year career. She coached teams to 14 district titles, nine regional titles, four HLS SL state championships, and two runner-up finishes. At Cox High School, she started the girls' volleyball program and won her first state title in 1996. She added state championships in 1999, 2001, 2004. Her volleyball teams advanced to the, the state tournaments 12 times in 17 years. She was elected as Beach District Coach of the Year, Region Coach of the Year, and State Coach of the Year on numerous occasions. Dr. LeBlanc coached field hockey at Princess Anne and led her team to their first ever state championship final in 1988. In addition to her coaching success, she serves as the athletic trainer at both Green Run and Princess Anne High Schools. Even today, she continues to offer support and assistance to coaches and speaks to teams at, as they advance through the postseason, showing her insight about the keys to success. As a VHSL athlete, she is a 1977 graduate of Frank Cox High School, where she played field hockey, basketball, tennis, and occasionally ran the mile for the track team. <laughs> well, <laughs> while attending William and Mary, she was a four-year member of the women's basketball team and threw the javelin for the women's track team. Claire is a certified athletic trainer and has spent summers working for the United States Olympic Committee as a trainer. Wow. Congratulations to Claire LeBlanc on this outstanding accomplishment and a lifetime of remarkable awards and wins. You have influenced countless students and staff to succeed in their athletic and academic careers. Thank you for your years of service and positive influence. Right, well, I got to briefly meet Mary and Evan, um, and I tell you what outstanding young adults they are, and parents in the audience, job well done, job well done. Over the weekend of March 5th, thousands of students from across the state competed in the DECA State Leadership Conference at the Virginia Beach Convention Center. DECA, formerly known as the Distributive Education Clubs of America, is an association of marketing students that encourages the development of business and leadership skills through the academic conferences and competitions. During this competition, students Mary Casper and Evan Need competed in the financial service team decision-making event against more than 30 other teams, and their duo placed first in the competition. Now, let's honor these students. Evan Need, oh, go ahead, yes, they deserve it. Evan Need is a senior in the Entrepreneurship and Business Academy at Kimsville High School. Evan is a serial entrepreneur, having started a business from the, businesses from the age of 12. He wow. currently runs the nonprofit Planting Shade which has planted over 12,000 tree seedlings to date and focuses on environmental activism and education. He has been involved in Decker for four years and is current, the current president of the organization. He is also the senior class president in Kempsville High School. And very shy, we can tell, right? <laughs> <laughs> very introverted. Um, <laughs> His career goals include continuing his studies in business and entrepreneurship. He is a Brickell Scholar and Barron Price honoree. He has been selected as a Jefferson Scholar at UVA, but has been accepted to numerous other colleges and universities, including UCLA, UNC, Chapel Hill, Berkeley, 
USC, and recently the University of Pennsylvania. So he's got a, got a big decision to make. <laughs> All right. Uh, Mary Casper is a senior in the on Oh, yep, let's, get, let's hear it for Alvin. Mary is a senior also at the Entrepreneurship and Business Academy at Kimsville High School. Mary currently serves as the SCA president and was also elected as the 2021 Homecoming Queen. Mary has explored many business-related endeavors, and she was a corporate finance strand student who also started a business sophomore year called Perfect. Perfect Health. Mary has been involved in Decker for four years, placing first in the district three years in a row in food marketing. Mary has been recognized as a NMSI scholar, AP scholar, and is a member of multiple honor societies. Mary is also a student athlete participating in track and women's lacrosse while in high school. Mary plans to major in physics and has aspirations of being a pilot in the Navy and hopes to accomplish those goals as she enters the U.S. Naval Academy this summer. Mary and Evan will also represent Kimsville High School and VB Schools at the International Career De Development Conference in Atlanta, Georgia in April 2022. Congratulations to both students on this tremendous win. Congratulations, yeah. guys. Yes, yes, we can have a photo op. Mary, do you want to stay up here for a second? There, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Woodhouse. Thank you. Congratulations. Okay, congratulations. Ms. Rye, this concludes the recognitions for the evening. Thank you. Okay, all good stuff. It's great to have our, our recognized honorees back in person. So now uh, we are up to adop agenda adoption. Item eight, any modifications to the agenda? Okay, hearing none, a motion to approve. Mrs. Riggs, a second. Mrs. Manning, all in favor, show a raised hand, please. Ms. Owens, how do you vote? I vote yes. Thank you. Ms. Melnick, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have a unanimous vote. The motion passed. Thank you. And with no superintendent report this cycle, we are now up to uh, the approval of our meeting minutes from our March 22nd regular school board meeting. Any modifications to these minutes? All right, hearing none, a motion to approve. Mrs. Hughes and a second, Mrs. Anderson. All in favor, kindly show a raised hand. Ms. Owens, how do you vote? I vote yes. Thank you. Vice Chair Melnick, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have a unanimous vote. Thank you, Madam Clerk. So now we, uh, this brings us to the public hearing on disposition of school board owned property known as the Laskin Road Annex. The school board will now hear public comment on the disposition of this school-owned property located at 1415 Laskin Road. As a reminder, our speaker has three minutes to present and will be given a 30-second warning before time expires. So Madam Clerk, would you please introduce our public hearing speaker? Thank you. Our speaker for this evening is Richard Gerloff. And welcome. Chairwoman Rye, members of the board, Superintendent Spence, I'm here uh, 
tonight as a lifelong resident of Virginia Beach. I'm a product of the public school system. I have seven children that were um, all attended um, public school in Virginia Beach and graduated. Um, I have two that are still remaining, but um, all of them will be uh, listening to dad give his speech tonight, and I'm terrified of their reaction when, when I'm home. So, but, you know, recently I, I was driving down Laskin Road, and I saw the for sale sign on the property, and I started investigating, and then I realized that tonight um, we'll be discussing it. So, um, you know, I, I, as I dug into it, I, I feel like the develop, developer's pro, uh, proposal was, is a fair one, and, uh, but I don't feel like it's the best use of the property, and y'all should reject it. Um, through, this, through this process, I um, you know, reminisced about m my family using the school grounds, um, learning to ride bikes, practicing sports, you know, even training our dogs. The, the community has used that property, that property uh, quite a bit. Um, and I just, you know, I just think that y'all should look at this, you know, so future generations can possibly use this property like we have. Um, you know, we have a great city and it's a fantastic place to live, but we're woefully short on green space. The area around the property has basically um, been fully developed. Um, you know, where, where are the children that live there? Where are they going to go play and enjoy the outdoors? And, um, in my opinion, the, the school board and the city need to maintain control of the par property. Uh, use it as a park or some sort of green space, uh, you know, where some sort of learning experience could maybe go on uh, for the children. You know, I think this is something that, that all of the, all the citizens of Virginia Beach could get behind. 30 seconds. Wow. Um, you know, a green type uh, uh, park would benefit the boosting of our mental health or our citizens go a long way towards healing the community after suffering through the pandemic. Um, finally, the, uh, the board should respectfully reject the proposal and maintain the old school grounds in surplus. A better use of the property can be found with a little more effort. Thank you. Madam Chair, that was our only speaker for the public hearing. Thank you, Madam Clerk. So the school board will now hear public comments on matters relevant to pre-K to 12 public education in Virginia Beach and the business of the school board and school division from citizens and delegations who signed up with the school board clerk prior to noon today. Persons not called to the podium to address the board are asked to be respectful of speakers so that the board and persons observing the meeting are able to hear and observe each speaker's comments. Persons signed up to speak will be called up three at a time we're asked that you proceed to line up when your name is called. For speakers who are outside of chambers, staff will bring these speakers in the hallway to line up. In-person student speakers will be called first, followed by student speakers participating through Zoom or telephone. Each speaker is asked to begin speaking once their name is called. As a reminder, each has three minutes to present and will be given a 30 second warning before time expires. Once time runs out, the speaker, uh, speakers may, or may refer to the online time tracker to keep track of their time. Once your time has expired, you're asked to, to uh, cease making remarks and leave the podium to allow the next speaker to queued. Speakers are responsible for being in chambers or online when they're called to speak. If a speaker is not present when called or is not online or able to unmute when called, the board at its sole discretion may allow the speaker to speak at the end of the public comment session. Members of the audience will not be recognized to assist an online speaker with making online comments. Finally, the school board, as always, invites the public to submit comments through our group email account, which can be found on our websites. So with that, Madam Clerk, would you please introduce 
Our first uh, speaker of the evening. Thank you, Madam Chair. Our first speakers will be Vincent Smith, Amy Solares, and Kathleen Brown. Good evening. Welcome. It's nice to finally see, actually see y'all's faces again. I'm Vincent Smith. I live in uh, Virginia Beach in District 5. I'm here to speak in opposition to your secondary English textbook selection. Um, this, the primary selection, the lowest cost selection, is full of surveys. They're full of surveys on controversial topics, but let's put that to the side and just say that they're full of surveys that are going to collect data on your students and their families. And I think that's a pretty bad idea because what you've done there is something that a lot of people don't realize happens in the background of social media. When you go on social media and you make an account, you think you're getting a service for that. You think that is the product. That social media is collecting your data and selling it. You are the product. You are not the customer. You're giving yourself away. But what this textbook is going to do is going to collect data on your students on what are seemingly controversial subjects and non-controversial subjects into packets that are going to be sold on the open market. Now, I find it shameful that either we knew this and we were okay with it, or we didn't know it. Which is it? It's got to be one or the other. So I would suggest that this board draft the policy or direction to the superintendent that says that all solicitations put out for proposals include language that say that your product or your service, if it includes a survey of any type, in any way, in any part of your product or service, will be declared non-responsive and it will be tossed. Because that way you can keep your students' lives private. And I'm going to put a little bit of time back in your evening and say thank you very much. Our next speaker is Amy Solares, Kathleen Brown, then Lindsay Bowen. Welcome. Hi. First, I want to say I absolutely think you should approve the Office of Safe Schools plan to replace the uh, school resource officers with retired uh, police officers and possibly military and let them carry firearms because that's how they're going to protect our schools. Now, um, I oppose the approval of the Actively Learn Online textbooks for a different reason than, than Vincent just said, the substance. They push sexual identity and gender identity on our children. I, I went through it. They push the separation of child and parent. Where did our education go? I'm asking all of you who are ready to approve these textbooks to stop for one moment and look what you will be bringing into our children's classrooms as young as 11 years old. Lessons actively asking how many guns are in the household are not education. Lessons actively asking what pronoun the students prefer, not education. Lessons actively asking how transgender day is important is not education. And lessons actively discussing sexual identity and gender identity are not education. Have you ever stopped to think what you're creating or what you're destroying? You're creating a generation of uneducated children because the focus is no longer on actual academics. You are actively working to destroy our children's innocence by taking away parental rights of when these topics are discussed and brought up on our own children. Why is sex being pushed in our classrooms? I cannot believe I'm speaking to a school board, elected officials, and I have to ask this question. Our children are being attacked with constant pressure about sexuality, gender identity, and race, and is coming from those of you who are allowing this, and you are elected to protect, to protect our children and their education. So incredibly shameful. Many of the online textbooks were not even available to be read or reviewed because there's an additional fee to purchase this rental license. Why is there an additional fee? Is, are they trying to hide something? And who's going to pay me back for the monies I spent to review that? Some of the titles are these books. Things Fall Apart, Monster, The New Queer Conscience, and Boyfriends with Girlfriends. 30 seconds. Education should have nothing to do with politics or sex. 
Yet here we are again, fighting to try and keep it out of our classrooms and protect our children and their education. If you vote to, the, to approve these textbooks, I believe you and your decisions are dangerous to our children, and you should no longer be allowed to make decisions regarding our children and our children's education. The legacy of this school board will be a disgrace as the only accomplishment will be taking away education. And that is time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kathleen Brown, then Lindsay Bohan, then Paula Chang. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Kathleen Brown. I am here tonight as a concerned parent of four children. I was going to focus my speech tonight on the equity survey, which is managed by third party Panorama, but I will instead focus the bulk of my speech on the textbook adoption. Before I do get into the textbooks, I want to say that you'd likely lar get a larger sample size of participants in your survey if you included an option, this doesn't belong in our schools. Moving on to the textbooks, I understand the division's desire to be flexible and how these online textbooks meet that desire because the division can select materials on an ongoing basis and can modify them over time. However, I do not trust the superintendent with determining which materials are acceptable for English when he believes a graphic novel depicting two individuals engaged in oral sex is appropriate literature in our school libraries, especially without parental opt-in. Today I ask that you vote no on the textbooks for a variety of reasons. Recently, the division put out an agenda which stated nearly one in three students in grades three through nine is reading below grade level. The division seemed pretty excited about the emotional skills of the children, but I am extremely concerned about the academic pitfalls that are not being recognized. As the texts are intended to be English textbooks, I do not believe placing political platforms and overstepping the parental rights to teach moral decision-making skills is effectively getting all of our students on track to succeed in math, science, history, and English. And that's really where we need to put the focus back. I do believe we should be teaching a complete and accurate history without political agenda on either side. I would once again ask the division to educate our children and teach them how to think, not what to think. And please stop allowing curriculums that allow for grooming of our children. Some things that are concerning to me in the text include teaching through a racial lens, teaching that everyone has racial bias, the history of coming out, questions about firearms in households, grooming materials, and the implication that parents monitoring their children's cell phone activity is a problem. Parents are supposed to monitor and know what their kids are doing. This is an intrusion on my rights as a parent. I'm really unsure if the cost of about $50, $54 per pupil is too high for a textbook, but it sure seems like it for a computer-based text. Many parents, like myself, are concerned about screen time that our kids are on the computer, and all experts agree that there should be reduced screen time. So for all of these reasons, please vote no on the textbook adoption. And Thank that you. is time. Our next speaker is Lindsay Bohan, Paula Chang, and then Sarah Gerloff. Good evening. Last October, Carolyn Weems proposed a resolution again to clarify equity training and teaching in our district. It was important to clarify the district's stance to put to rest any confusion or misinformation about divisive concepts being taught in Virginia Beach. The resolution specifically sought to clarify the following ideas. That any race is inherently superior or inferior, that race or skin color makes you either the oppressor or the oppressed, that we are responsible for the actions of our predecessors who share our race or skin color, and that the United States is fundamentally and inherently racist, just to name a few. In the end, no one is surprised that the majority voted against it. On January 15th, our newly elected governor, Glenn Youngkin, issued executive order number one to ensure excellence in public education, K-12, through in the Commonwealth by taking the first step to end the use of inherently divisive concepts, including critical race theory and to raise academic standards. He continued, political indoctrination has no place in our classrooms. The vast 
majority of learning in our schools involves imparting critical knowledge and skills in math, science, history, reading, and other areas that should be non-controversial. Item 5 of that executive order states, quote, the superintendent of public instruction shall review and revise or rescind superintendent's memo 050-19 to remove reference to any inherently divisive concepts. What is the superintendent's memo? Google it. It was published in February 2019 and basically invites all superintendents, administrators, and teachers to teach every lesson through a racial lens and provides a ton of resources to do so, including the book Foundations of Critical Race Theory in Education. <clears throat> Seven months later, they added a statement that CRT is not included in the Virginia Standards of Learning, so at least it won't be on any end of year testing. It's no wonder it, won't, it needs to be revised or rescinded, and it's not surprising that this was executive order number one. An example from the curriculum that you are going to vote on tonight and probably pass is the following example from an 11th grade assignment. Quote, read to the swimmer and discuss the meaning of how and Im meaning and how imagery impacts the poem. 30 seconds. Then point out that the poem does not explicitly state whether the speaker or swimmer is black, and then reread the poem twice. Once read it with the idea that it is focused on black people, and once to read it with the idea that it applies to all people. My question is this, why would you commit to spending $2 million on a new reading curriculum that clearly has divisive concepts? Rather than charting the course, you lag behind and it will eventually lose on this as well, just like you lost on the masks. But this time you'll be wasting and that is time. $2 million. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paula Chang, Sarah Gerloff, and then Stephanie Lensicki. Good evening. Good evening. Um, two things, Mrs. Rye, I, I understand when you were in your um, meeting before this that you talked about when the work is going to be done in this building that there is going to be another option for where people can go to listen to the school board meeting and my, makes me wonder, and this is rhetorical, why that wasn't done before when we could have gotten a larger space during COVID. So thank you to all who came here to speak about the heinous sexual grooming, radical political indoctrination, racial, racial division, and extreme intrusion into parental rights that are intentionally placed in the Virginia Beach public schools in multiple ways, through the SEL, through your teacher training, through the curriculum and the textbooks that you're gonna vote on tonight, and I have been through them as well, um, and through the Chromebooks. These choices by Aaron Spence, Kip Rogers, and Lakeish Parrott highlight where they desire to take your children and it is not a good place. And by the way, Dr. Spence, we're already receiving reports. Dr. Spence, I'm up here. I know that I'm not down on the table where you're looking. Um, that uh, our children have been given SEL surveys in spite of the fact their parents have opted them out of them. Sneaky little Chromebooks, I would say. But not only children are affected by what you're passing tonight, but our teachers are teachers who do not like what they are forced to expose children to in the classroom or on the Chromebooks and are harmed. And as a result, they are responding by leaving the profession and leaving the Virginia Beach City Public Schools in droves and you all know it. Couple of examples. I was recently talking to a garden store employee who mentioned she had been a teacher who chose to leave the profession. When I asked her why, she said she loved teaching but that in the last few years she has found herself unwilling to impart to students the information she knew to be wrong for them. She found the school system, under Dr. Spence, who's reading his on table again, unwilling to listen to the concerns of the teachers, and, and the, thus once they were uh, expressed their concerns, they were pressured, and there was pressure put in place on them when they voiced their concerns. She said her son had followed her Dr. Spence into the profession, taught in a prestigious program, but is leaving the profession now after four years. You guys, really. Two nights ago at a restaurant, the table beside us were teachers, and guess what they're doing? They're leaving the school system. And you know what they're gonna do? They're gonna form a school, which is what a lot of teachers ought to do. So they will remain in the profession, but, and they will be in their own school so they can teach in a manner consistent with the calling they had when they chose to be teachers. Good for them. Any parent who wants to know the name of their new school, feel free to reach out to me. 30 seconds. Teachers, this system does not appear to have your best interest in heart. They're aligned, along with some of the school board, with the Virginia Beach Education Association, a union, which represents only a small fraction of teachers. This union wields too much power, 
and doesn't appear to listen actually either to what's good for you and encourages voting for things that are good for them, the Education Association. To teachers who think they're stuck and have no voice, it's not true. There are more of you than them. There are more of you in the VBs than there are who try to push you to teach what you feel is wrong. And that is time. You have more power. Our next speaker is Sarah Gerloff, Stephanie Lansicki, and Lane Gerties. Thank you, and I'll remind our audience to please refrain from any clapping, but welcome. Thank you. I would like your undivided attention, please. Spence, that means you as well. The following happened to a woman last week, quote, I was walking my dog an hour ago around Virginia Beach Middle School, and this silver sedan drove through the school parking lot and was driving slowly with me while I was walking, trying to give me $500 just to talk to them. They were African American, maybe four or five of them. The young man told me to call, not to call anyone. They have guns in the car. This happened when the kids went in, back inside from playing on the field." End quote. The principal of Virginia Beach Middle sent an email regarding this incident, but failed to give the details. In my opinion, her email was insufficient since the details were omitted. Full disclosure and transparency is a must in order for parents to decide how to handle a situation such as this. There's an elephant in the room that many do not want to acknowledge, but it has grown so enormous we can no longer pretend it does not exist. The problem is human trafficking. In 2018, the Human Trafficking Institute released a report that ranked Virginia sixth in the nation for active human trafficking cases. One can look at the geographical location of Hampton Roads and begin to realize this area is a major hub for human trafficking. Container ships enter and exit Hampton Roads ports, and the Chesapeake Bay is easy water access to six states, Washington, D.C., and I-95, a major trafficking highway. I attended a presentation about human trafficking recently. One of the speakers clearly showed the correlation between human trafficking and what has been transpiring in our schools. The obscene books in our schools are being used to desensitize our children to the immorality of pornography and pedophilia. This speaker also described how CRT, social emotional learning, equity trading, whatever name you want to call it, is a divisive tool used to destroy families and create shame, loss of value, and loss of self-worth, which leads to greater vulnerability in children. Anyone with a vulnerability is at greater risk of being trafficked. Human traffic, trafficking is all about exploiting vulnerability. Aaron Spence and the majority on this board have been aiding- seconds have been aiding and abetting the multi-billion dollar human trafficking industry with the content they have allowed and promoted in our schools. It appears the individuals that are supposed to protect the most vulnerable from enemies foreign and domestic have actually become the enemies. There comes a time when silence is betrayal. We can be no silent no more. Our next speaker is Stephanie Lansiki, then Lane Gerties, then Tara Chang. Yes, I was going to start. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Hi, everybody. I'm Stephanie. Um, I am a girl, because I think there's been confusion about that in society lately. Um, and I am not an expert on all the things that you all are, uh, but um, I know that decisions happen here that funnel down all the way to the future. And really, uh, I, I'm a nurse, I'm a counselor, a parent, an educator, um, but I guess what I wanna comment on is just from my perspective, that's all. Um, when I looked at what was being discussed and the content in the books, um, I the question I had just as a regular person is, you know, why? Because this is super weird to push a lot of this stuff in front of kids. You know, like, why are people uh, wanting to do this? And the first thing I think of is uh, these people who want this in front of kids have suffered. They've been through stuff, uh, painful things, and they by themselves. And they want to make sure that all the kids that they can 
uh, possibly prevent having to go through the same thing they went through. They want to try to prevent that. I understand that. Um, but the thing I'm, I'm not sure that they understand is the cycle and the circle of transference of, you know, this happened to them, so they're fighting against it for all the other kids, but it hasn't happened to all those other kids. And I want that, the people who are arguing for that, I want them to see that putting s this sexual content in front of kids um, at this time is actually just gonna continue that cycle, not break it, because, uh, okay, like this poem in one of the books, I, I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs. That's a, a visual that got stuck in my head as an adult, you know? Diamonds between my thighs? What in the world? So, I mean, whoa, that's stuck in my head, right? You want that stuck in a kid's head from reading a textbook, then they go home where they're dealing with weird, strange feelings that it wakes up inside them, weird thoughts that they haven't had before, and guess what? They're by themselves without someone to walk them through it, which is what, which is exactly what happened. 30 seconds. That's exactly what happened to the people who are fighting for this. They had bad things happen to them, and they were left to deal with it by themselves. So they're fighting against it. And yes, I believe their intentions are good, most of them. Yes, maybe there's a darkness riding in on those good intentions, uh, you know, but I just want y'all to see that the cycle continues with this. It doesn't break because they're left alone still. And that is time. Our next speaker is Lane Gerties, Tara Chang, then Mary Hofer. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chairperson, esteemed uh, board. Uh, my name is Lane Gertis. I'm a proud father of three, two of which are in Virginia Beach Public Schools right now. Uh, I wanted to talk tonight about the curriculum in the proposed textbooks. Um, after looking through it online, uh, I have to say that I was uh, not happy with the age appropriate uh, appropriateness of the content, and I think we can do better. Uh, I'll, I'll keep my example short. Um, from the seventh grade content, the Maya Angelou poem, I Still Rise, and the article, All the Cool Kids Are Doing It. Both of these lessons highlight sexuality in our young kids. Talk about uh, sex, oral sex, drug use, vandalism. These are 12 year olds. Uh, Modern entertainment and social media today are bent on sexualizing our kids earlier and earlier and earlier, like it's okay. And it makes it harder and harder for us as parents. And uh, we as parents, teachers, and a community, we've got to say enough is enough. We have to stop it at some point. Continuing on in the sixth grade curriculum, there's a lesson entitled what the villain in Black Panther can teach us about revolutionary history. Uh, in this movie, the character wants to violently, violently overthrow governments that have mistreated black people. It then draws parallels between real life historical figures, including Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Mahatma Gandhi, two of the arguably most prolific and influential proponents of nonviolence. That's sixth grade. And is that really what we want to plant in our sixth graders' minds, that violent protests are OK? It's, it's, it's not acceptable. We have to be cautious and thoughtful about what we teach our kids at these ages. I urge the board to vote no on this curriculum. Uh, we can do better. Our kids, 30 seconds. Our kids deserve it. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Tara Chang, Mary Hofer, and Aaron Rash. Good evening. So I am going to be starting with a video by Delegate Nick Freitas. You notice how it's never the right that's tried to push a political ideology on other people's children through the public schools? It's always the left. Because apparently they've done such a great job with reading, writing, and arithmetic that they've got all this extra time to talk about the sexual preferences of adults with nine-year-olds. Yeah, nothing weird about that. 
So my, my idea is get back to teaching arithmetic, biology, history, the good and the bad, instead of leftist grooming. And once again, as Vladimir Zelensky says, Aaron Spence, only cowards want to hurt children. And that actually uh, lies to the handmaidens of Aaron Spence as well. Have a good night. Our next speaker is Mary Hofer, Aaron Rash, and then William Duke. Hi. Good evening. Thanks. We'll put this here. These are the TikTok accounts that are still active representing the Virginia Beach uh, Middle School. I'm here to talk again uh, about what's being done and not done to protect our kids on the managed school devices and also the ongoing cyberbullying problem at Virginia Beach Middle School. During meeting with the CIO last week, I found out software used to manage Chromebooks called Securely um, does not flag or notify parents for searches of the words depression or anxiety. It does, however, flag for the word suicide. I asked why and was told the word suicide was con considered imminent. Anxiety and depression were not, even though they are two risk factors of suicide. The legal definition of imminent is the immediate threat of harm. Let that sink in. Shouldn't parents be notified if their child is searching risk factors of suicide, not just be alerted when there's an immediate threat of harm? I want to see a list of words the school considers to be imminent and worthy of flagging. I also want to know what's being done to stop kids from creating TikTok accounts to slander and bully students and teachers in the schools. If an account gets taken down, five pop up in its place. How are these kids being punished? These kids are using the school logo to represent its content. They don't fear punishment or consequences. Why? Because you either get in-school suspension or if you're super lucky, you might get a two-day out-of-school suspension. The punishment has to outweigh the thrill these kids are getting with these accounts. Together, we have failed our kids. They're stuck in a digital world they don't know how to navigate socially or emotionally, and a lot of people in this room don't either. I would venture to say that a majority of the school board have either little or no experience using these social media platforms or how the technology can be used, which means you don't understand the dangers of it and how kids in your schools are using it daily. I know you're thinking, they're your damn kids. But like y'all, there are a lot of parents who are unaware of how to monitor and protect their kids online. I'm here because for the first time since my kid's been in school here, I'm scared for her, for all of our kids. Believe me, school board meetings were the last place I thought I'd be. I'm a parent who has tattoos and probably says the F word too much. I don't think my voice, I didn't think my voice would be heard or that I'd be taken seriously. What I'm saying is important though, and the dangers are real. So I'm encouraging parents to get informed, get involved. You have the same seconds. right as anyone sitting in those chairs to be heard. No disrespect to the school board, but how can you make the best decisions for our children if you don't understand the challenges growing up in the digital social media world because you haven't? I demand our school board to do more, more to arm parents with knowledge and show them how to use the tools to combat the problem. A pamphlet stuffed in the bottom of our kids' backpacks is not going to cut it anymore. Our next speaker is Aaron Rash, William Duke, and then Meryl Rutledge. Welcome. Hi. So I have to say the fact that you all sit here now maskless after fighting us for so long while claiming to be scared for your life and others just proves that whatever the media is currently pushing or what your current political narrative is, is exactly what the school board bandwagons onto and pushes for. First, you wanted to keep a mask over my child's mouth. Now you want to integrate teaching them that they can now put a penis or a vagina in their mouth at age 11 in sixth grade. Unit 8 for 6th grade English. All the cool kids are doing it. Lessons discussing oral sex, sexual intercourse. Um, I'm sorry, when do teaching 11, 12-year-olds about oral sex become a part of an English classroom curriculum or any type of sex at all? Here I am as a parent trying to get my 10-year-old to stop putting Legos and barrettes in her mouth. Meanwhile, you want to add a unit in English about oral sex when she's 11. It seems the Virginia Beach school system is on a slippery slope of doing away with 20 minutes of reading and having 20 minutes of Pornhub instead. What's next? Bring your favorite sex toy to class? You worry about my daughters wearing a tank top and midriffs to school because it's sexually distracting, but you're going to now promote intercourse and sex in everyday English classes at 11 to 12 years old. I think opening the doors to oral sex is a lot more distracting than someone's shoulder showing. 
Why in seventh grade are we reading poems about does my sexiness upset you? What seventh grader is sexy? Why in eighth grade are we now speaking about pregnancy loss? Years ago, we weren't trying to teach our kids how to prevent teen pregnancy and sexual activity. Now it's like I'm going to have to worry about tween pregnancy and sexual activity. These children have enough sexual pressure from other friends, social media, TV shows, and movies that they don't need it added into their everyday English curriculum as well, and certainly not starting at a sixth grade level. All this sex push seems, leads me to wonder why then in 11th grade is there a unit, unit six, do your parents monitor your phones, instructing students that their parents should not be monitoring their cell phones or tracking them. I'm sorry, but where in the hell is that anybody's business in this room? And what does that have to do with English curriculum? I can answer that poll right now for all of you, along with many, many other parents, I'm sure. Yep, I sure do go through my child's phone because there are children and it's my job to make sure they're safe in all aspects. A lot of these articles in this unit, <clears throat> these new unit textbooks seem extremely one-sided, biased, and very, very sexually inappropriate for certain age groups. You all keep forgetting as a school 30 board seconds. and in, in a classroom setting that it is not your job to mold my child who are minors into what your personal political views are, what your personal narrative is, and certainly not mold them into what you deem as appropriate sexual ideology at such young ages. Thank you. Our next speaker is William Duke, Meryl Rutledge, and then Sandra Frazier. Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> I'm Dr. William Lewis Duke, Vice Chair of the Tidewater Libertarian Party, dedicated to Americanism, and I rise now to speak against the teaching of Marxist revolution in the classrooms of our ninth grade children. The author in question is Angela Davis. Let me tell you a little bit about Angela Davis. She is the recipient of the Lenin Peace Prize. And yes, I do mean that Lenin. The award was given her by the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. The Soviet Union is now long out of business, of course, being replaced by a mature fascist state which seems to be the norm for all you socialist utopias. Uh, I'm sure it came as a great surprise to anyone like Angela who believes in the wisdom of Karl Marx. A darling of all the self-loathing, truth-twisting left, Professor Davis has enjoyed a remarkable academic career. Starting in 1969 at UCLA, then on to San Francisco State University, and now at UC Santa Cruz. Along the way, she was twice nominated by the Communist Party USA as their vice presidential candidate, a high honor. And I might parenthetically add that guns belonging to Angela Davis were used to kill four people during an armed takeover of a courtroom in Marin County in 1970, right at the start of her illustrious career. Now, this Angela Davis has been peddling her mutilated Marxism to befuddled American students for over 50 years, and bless her bleeding red heart, my God, she's still at it at the age of 78. Does any of this sound like an appropriate resume for the contributing author of a textbook for young children? America had its own revolution. Uh, I'm not a counter-revolutionary. I support the American Revolution. It wasn't Marxist, it wasn't Maoist, it wasn't fascist. And unlike those failed ideologies, it creates, created a long-lasting state, the oldest republic on earth today, the most prosperous nation on this earth today. If there is some good reason to teach revolutionary philosophy, philosophy to ninth graders, can we not find a better writer than Angela Davis, please? Uh, I've got some suggestions. I don't know, Franklin, Jefferson, Adams, Madison, Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt, Martin Luther King, Ronald seconds. Reagan. They all knew about revolutions. Now, doesn't that sound, uh, and they were prolific writers, uh, doesn't that sound at least a little bit more appropriate? I mean, we want our kids to be Americans, not Marxists from Europe. Uh, and I, as you hear from the audience, there's uh, speakers. Uh, people don't like this woke nonsense. There are free programs from Hillsdale College you might want to investigate. And that is time. Our next speaker is Meryl Rutledge, Sandra Frazier, and then Melissa Lukeson. Good evening. Good evening. Let me be very clear. Nobody in this room hates each other. 
As I look around this room and I don't see masks, we find out what the big lie is. Too many people are stuck with partisan relationships instead of looking out for the best interests of our children. Instead of these books that teach the vision and these books that teach our kids to be sexualized, I agree with everybody in this room. We should be teaching math history. We should be teaching Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And we should be telling whoever these book authors, you can keep it and you can burn them up. We see each other working with each other. Right there, all of y'all up there, different backgrounds, different races. Y'all came up the same way. Do you think your parents, let's bring it back to time. Do you think your parents can hear the stuff we are talking about right now and find it acceptable? Absolutely not. The problem here is we have lost a way to talk to each other and use some common sense because we've been so bothered about what somebody in D.C. or Richmond thinks. You have your own independent mind. You have a chance to stand up for what is right. Yes, silence is of cowards, but silence is condemnation of what is happening to our children every single day. These books are not stopping the fights. They are not stopping the bullying. They are not stopping anything that y'all hope to achieve to make sure our kids have a proper education. But it's stopping us from moving forward past the pandemic that we all was led to believe we wasn't going to live another day, but I see y'all still breathing. I see y'all without those masks. I remember the last time I was here. I said enough was enough, but all of a sudden a State of the Union address made it enough. That's not what we want for our kids to see and how we behave. We have to do whatever it takes to make sure these monsters, these pedophiles, these murderers, and those who seek to destroy the seconds. rest of our kids, they stay in jail while our kids go free. See, freedom is expensive now. It definitely is. But our kids, on the other hand, are priceless. So let's show them unconditional love. Let's show we can all work together and we can all love one another. Because we was all brought up the same way. And we are doing just fine. And that's why we all still love America. And that is time. Our next speaker is Sandra Fazier, then Melissa Lukeson, then Andy Bond. All right. Another friendly reminder to our audience about the refraining from applause. And welcome, ma'am. Oh, thank you. Um, I wish I didn't have to be here again. I haven't attended many meetings lately, but this down. OK, thank gotcha. you. Thank you. I'm short. Um, I am, I can't believe I have to even talk about this. I am appalled at the information that has come out about what's in this curriculum. And I was at um, a meeting last night where um, Tanya Gold spoke, and she is a survivor of human trafficking. And some of the stuff she talked about is this, this, the way kids are targeted and groomed is exactly exactly what you are setting our kids up for. I, I can't even believe that you people sleep at night knowing that this information is being thrown into our children, into their minds. They're vulnerable. You're making them more vulnerable. Children are living in a world that is so different than what we grew up in. And I can't believe that you want to promote sexuality in elementary school, middle school, even high school. I think when I was in high school, and I'm a graduate of Floyd Callum, in the class of 67, we had one, one girl who got pregnant in the senior year. Now how many? And how many we don't know about because they have abortions. I don't know. But all I'm saying is this promotes more sexuality. It promotes feelings of hopelessness. It, feel, it promotes feelings of worthlessness. And you're, you're allowing it. You are responsible. We elected you to protect our children. And I, I'm just thankful that my grandson goes to school in Florida. You know, he's not here. Because 
because then you'd really not want to hear me talk. I'm, I'm going to cut it short because everybody else has, Amy, oh my gosh, I sat there and said, I have nothing else to say. I, I have nothing. Um, everybody has spoken. Uh, many of these people have children in the schools. I don't, but I am a concerned citizen because this is our future. And America was a shining light. People still want to come here, but they don't come here because they want to be human trafficked. They don't come here because they want their kids taught about oral sex when they're in middle school, elementary school. It's an abomination. 30 seconds. And every single one of you that votes for this should be ashamed, and you will be voted out of office. Our next speaker is Melissa Lukeson, then Andy Bond, then Diana Lynn Howard. Good evening. Good evening. I would need the remainder of this evening to adequately expose all the dog whistling, misrepresentation, and mischaracterizations from the majority of speakers this evening. Here's a glaring display of ineptitude at reading comprehension by Students First Virginia. They cite an article in sixth grade module under unit eight as, quote, all the cool kids are doing it, hyphen, lesson discusses oral sex, sexual intercourse, and smoking marijuana. First, let's get this embarrassing fact check out of the way. The article's title is, quote, all the cool kids aren't doing it. Teens stink at judging peers' behavior, end quote. The article was written by a postdoctoral fellow at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. It shares results from a study centered around teenagers view their peers' behavior re related to age-appropriate stereotypes. The mischaracterization of this is unsurprising, but infuriating nonetheless. It is all meant to heighten emotions because political people are trying to manufacture outrage to get people to the polls. People so blinded with rage and bias that they couldn't even read the article's title correctly. Another example for those who may have found themselves believing everything these posers in politics are standing here screaming about, you know how I know they didn't read what they speak of? The article they cite from Angela Davis is actually from Grace Lee Boggs, who is an incredible Asian American civil and labor rights activist who was interviewed at a woman's conference by Angela Davis. Opposition doesn't want the $2 million textbook because they think it's written like a social justice warrior's manifesto, but they don't want the other one because that has a $3 million price tag. So if children's education is so important to you, then why does your position value money more than children's education? The sixth grade unit article titled The 13-Year-Old Striking to Save the Planet with the attached comment praises AOC. For those who don't know, AOC is a New York Congresswoman, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. This is a direct quote from the article. We started talking about politicians again. As our generation reaches voting age, more environmentally aware leaders are being elected, such as New York Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. That's it, end quote. Would the people running a political action committee have said anything if the author used Elise Stefanik, a US Congresswoman from New York and a Republican who signed a resolution expressing climate urgency in 2015? Even the, QAMOM, seconds. even the QAMOM's fascist in training Daddy DeSantis has made overtures to curb climate changes in Florida. So the pattern of attacking specific issues like race and sexuality is disturbing. But the days of selectively spinning everything to fit this intolerant, bigoted narrative is coming to an end. I ask the school board to invest in these new textbooks. Thank you. Our next speaker is Andy Bond. Diana Howard, and then Daphne Stagg. Good evening. Good evening. Great to see you all. I'm here to speak in the lack of support that I suggest you should have for the, the learning materials that are proposed. I used to live in, because I think they're um, skewed and inappropriate. Um, I used to live in Saudi Arabia. Love the culture. Love learning about it. I think it's great that there are, and I did a search on Ramadan, there are four discussions of Ramadan, and I think that's just great. As a Catholic guy, I looked up Lent, and there are none. So that's why, that's an example of skewing that I, I don't think is a good thing. We should teach about Ramadan, but I also think we should teach about Lent, and they go hand in hand, they're similar. The Fight for Reproductive Rights is another um, article or book 
uh, in the materials. And that right was pushed by Governor Northam to the point that I think 90% of us would call it murder. And so I don't think it's really appropriate that you all are addressing that in that form with that slant without addressing the other side. Uh, so that's another example of impropriety. And then I did a search on the third to fourth grade. And what came up was LGBTQ history and literature. Okay, uh, do they know how to spell that at that age? I, I think it's just wrong that we're bringing that to their attention at that age, it's wrong. What I do suggest um, we pay attention to and save the money and use it to do is increase our instruction in math. A mathematically literate student recognizes the role that mathematics plays in the world in order to make well-founded judgments and decisions needed by constructive, engaged, and reflective citizens. That's from the OECD. And they say that Japan, Estonia, Korea, the Netherlands, Switzerland, Poland, Belgium, Canada, Denmark, Slovenia, United Kingdom, Austria, Finland, Germany, Ireland, Sweden, Czech Republic, Latvia, France, New Zealand, Norway, and this is in order of scores. 30 seconds. Norway, Portugal, Australia, Italy, the OECD average, Iceland, Russia, Slovak Republic, Luxembourg, Hungary, Spain, and then the United States. Let's address math. Let's do the basics. Let's save the money on these textbooks and just go back to, to teaching our kids what they'll need to be able to compete in a world with Spain and Hungary at least. And that is time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Diana Lynn Howard, then Daphne Stagg. Good evening, everybody. My name is Diana Howard, and I'm the chair of the Virginia Beach Tea Party. Our constitution for Virginia provides for a quality education. I'm not sure we have a quality education anymore. We have lots of um, children that are graduating high school without the tools that they need to even go into college. They have to take remedial classes. We have children that are being pushed ahead, right? And then they're graduating and they have a third grade reading level. This is not acceptable. There's a lot of parents here that were concerned about different books that were in libraries, but they were not allowed to show them here or read them here. If you can't show the pictures or read them to a bunch of adults, why are they being given to our children? We don't send our children to school to be sexualized or to be indoctrinated. We send them here to learn. You are not the, the parents of these children. Parents did not give up the parental rights when they sent their kids to school. They shouldn't have to opt out of some of this curriculum. They should know about it so that they can opt in. You have a billion dollar budget. I think we can do better. Our next speaker is Daphne Stagg. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I'm just here to ask why you are um, considering books that are rated 1.9 out of five stars. Um, Achieve 3000 Inc. 1.9 stars out of five. I looked up hotels in Virginia Beach with one star. There are none, zero. There are only four in Hampton Roads, and I'm sure none of you would take your family there. But 1.9 stars is good enough for our children. What would ever make you choose the lowest, worst curriculum for our schools? You represent 60,000 students, and you decided to adopt the garbage for our students. Is that what you consider above the curve? 
Our students are already below reading level. They're failing. And uh, why would you choose this? The lowest curriculum. Dumbing down of America is real, and it starts right here with the school board. Ms. Rye, for the, the life of me, I can't understand what you're doing. Um, I've stopped speaking for the past couple months, and I've just watched. And I see you being manipulated, and uh, we don't understand who is directing you and these horrible, immoral decisions you've been making, all of you. It's, it's astounding and mind-boggling. It's, uh, you know, we, we see the attorney directing you. We see Spence telling you when to stop talking. Uh, you know, you wrote that letter to Annie that she couldn't come into the, in here anymore for a year and speak, and you signed that. Not the attorney, nobody else signed it. You're responsible legally for that. You, you're being manipulated, all of you. I, we watched Trinice freak out when uh, the pictures were shown, but you dis all decided that it was a good idea to put pornography in the schools. Seriously? That's not manipulation? Seconds. I can't, I, I can't imagine any of you bringing that book to your grandchildren. Would you do that? Give that to your grandchildren? No. Uh, why, and I want to know why you think our children deserve a one-star education. Can anybody answer that? It's like a and that is time. dumpster fire up here. Madam Chair, that was our last in-person speaker. We will move on to our online speakers. Colleen Clemsonton, please unmute. Welcome. Good evening and happy math month. Last week, I completed the district's educational equity survey as a parent of this division. Section four of the survey is titled Increase Access to and Success in Rigorous Learning Opportunities for All Students. Within this section, it read, enhancing support for reading in kindergarten through second grade. However, nowhere was it mentioned about enhancing support for mathematics in kindergarten through second grade, nor was increasing math support addressed in the superintendent's estimation of needs budget. And yet, in the Compass to 2025 strategic framework in goal one, developing, implementing, and monitoring a K-12 plan for improving math is mentioned. Where are we in the developing stage? What has been implemented and where is the monitoring? How can we truly say that we are 21st century educators when our district and state will not publicly acknowledge the need for increasing intervention support and resources in the area of mathematics, specifically in the, 30, in the early years? In VB, we have 55 elementary schools. Every school has one full-time reading specialist, which is help funded by the EIRI, the Early Intervention Reading Initiative. There are schools that have more than one, depending on grant and Title I funding. However, out of the 55 elementary schools in Virginia Beach, only 45 have a full-time math specialist. And just like with reading, some schools have more than one, depending on Title I and grant money. That leaves 10 schools with a part-time math specialist to do all the administrative and remediation protocols that they are required to complete in a compressed amount of time. Are we giving the students in these 10 schools equitable access to intervention and remediation in a timely manner? We are no longer in a time of drill and rote memory when it comes to math. The curriculum calls for explanation and reasoning that many students do not come equipped with. This is why we need full-time math specialists in every building to assist teachers in unpacking all the remediation and instructional objectives to follow the district's five C's. My husband has always told his sailors, if you have a problem, come to me, but be sure to have an idea or solution to fix it. My problem is that we need a rigorous early intervention protocol for math in this district and state. My solution, let's truly embrace our motto and be ahead of the curve. Dr. Spence, our district needs to team up with other districts within the state to convince the DOE that an early intervention math initiative is critically needed. We need to have the General Assembly and the DOE invested in mathematics as much as they are in reading. It's been almost 30 years since the inception of EIRI, and it's time to bring math into the fold. 
I've spoken to primary level teachers and they are 100% behind the idea of having a program similar to PALS for Math. If the DOE teamed up with UVA to create and implement PALS for Reading, why can we not do the exact same thing for math? If we want our students to be truly successful in math and become a competitor in today's global market for research and innovation, then we need to make sure that early interventions and support for math are provided equitably in every school. And I'm sorry I can't be there personally. Our next speaker is Alexis Gerdes. Please unmute. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chairwoman Rye and Vice Chairwoman Melnick. My name is Alexis Gerdes, and I'm the parent of two Virginia Beach public school students. I'm here today to talk about the proposed student textbooks as it pertains to online versus physical options. To my knowledge, the students at my daughter's middle school spend approximately 80% of their time on their Chromebooks during formal class instruction. I am not singling out teachers here. I'm only bringing my concerns to the members of the school board today. While I'm aware the jobs we are preparing our students for in the future will look significantly different than the jobs of today, I am extremely concerned with their well being, and you should too. Pre COVID screen time conditions may have still been high, but the usage level today is unprecedented. How can we? find the balance. We must provide a foundation for our children during these developmental years so they can be better equipped for their future endeavors. From the official journal of the American Academy of Pediatrics, in a review of 67 studies of screen time, 90% found that screen time was adversely associated with sleep health. In the National Institute of Health, after seven plus hours a day of screen time, MRIs found a difference in the physical brain structure, signifying a thinning of the cortex, thought to affect the maturity process, causing earlier maturation. According to the John Hopkins Institute, excess screen time throughout the day has shown increased numbers of neck and back problems. They recommend no more than two hours a day. Increased screen time can induce nearsightedness at earlier ages. The research shows that with greater than five hours per day of screen time, the risk of obesity goes up five times. Our number one priority, your number one priority, all of you, should be to put students first by doing what's best for them in all areas. I'm talking academically, physically, and emotionally. That is your responsibility. That is why we hired you. That is why your constituents voted for you. How does the school board plan to address this? It must be addressed. We need actual solutions. You seconds. guys, you, you sit here every time and you guys don't even, you're just yelling at each other or you're ignoring each other. It's absurd. What are we teaching our children? We are examples to our children. This has to change. We must get back to the basics. Our children deserve better. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Nick Nichols. Please unmute. Good evening. Good evening. The purpose of an educational system is academics. I've asked for school systems to give me a thousand African American and Hispanic engineers. Tell me how these books do that. Let me give you some quotes and ideas from what these books are. It paints those with white skin as biased against those with black skin. I know couples who are mixed race and our ethnic backgrounds are different. What about the ramifications to those kids and relationships? How do we reimagine community, family, sexual identity? Well, how come it's never about reimagining what Dr. King wanted, which is to focus on our character and Rodney King getting along together in spite of our differences? And about identities and sexual identities, I know LGBTQ folks. They work, own homes, rent apartments, drive cars. They lose their grandmothers, play with their dogs like everyone else. They're not laying around having sex all the time. These books give an extremely skewed and wrong view of LGBTQ folks. And it's like they're incapable or not worth contributing to society like others. The other polling questions that they ask of students like of guns in the home, who suffered a pregnancy loss, do parents monitor their phones and, and cell phone time? 
how do questions like these help them get a job and move ahead in a career? That's what we pay you for. How does it help them to develop adult responsible personal characteristics and soft skills to help succeed? The sexual content in books is grooming. It teaches minors that sexual relationships are normal and pushes the age of consent down to younger and younger. Let me give you a few sentences from a sentencing guideline that y'all were emailed. 78% of children in images and videos are estimated to be younger than 12 years old. 80% appear to be girls. 70% appear to be taken in a home setting. A lot of these are sexually explicit poses, acts, violence, humiliation, bondage, and bestiality, and a substantial minority includes images depicting sex acts with infants or toddlers. It frequently depicts children, toddlers, and infants being sexually assaulted, physically abused, tortured, and humiliated. For example, this is the mildest of what I could get. The following content recently supported a guilty plea and conviction for child pornography processions. Not one, but multiple videos of babies literally being tied, hung upside down from a ceiling, their mouths muffled to reduce their screams, object inserted in them, and burned with fire. And that's what your books lead to. Think about it. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jerome Bell. Please unmute. Welcome. Mr. Bell, please unmute. We can't hear you, Mr. Bell. I, I am unmuted. How about that? We're good now. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, people eloquently before me stated their opinions about a lot of these topics and issues on these books. I am definitely a no vote on these books, but really what concerned me, I have two specific things that concern me, and that's that this third uh, party company called Achieve 3000 uh, is not only using these this information of indoctrinating and grooming our kids as young as 12 into transgenderism and CRT, but they're actively extracting confidential family and private information are uh, using surveys. And I, I believe that they're breaking the law and violating the Fourth Amendment of rights of, of parents by asking uh, questions like, how many guns are in the home and are these uh, guns locked up? That's really none of your business or none of their business as well. You know, and to uh, play on kids' minds, because kids don't know any better. They may, they may know about the guns and they may not. Um, but that's none of their business. And I don't think that that should be a question um, asked of, of a child. And also, uh, the other specific uh, thing I wanted to address is, is, is the unit about Angela Davis. Uh, and I would like to know, why does this lesson idolize a communist by making children believe that, that she's good by calling her an activist? That's just more linguistic programming. Angela Davis is not only a Marxist, but a full-blown communist, a devout member of the Communist Party USA. During the 1980s, she was twice um, she uh, she was twice the Communist Party uh, candidate for vice president. And I'm sure most of you may not have known that. In 1991, amid the dissolution of the Soviet Union, she was part of a faction in the Communist Party that broke away to establish the Committees of Correspondence for Democracy and Socialism, another communist organization. And. Um, in Davis, she, she's received various awards, including the Soviet Union's, not Russia, but the Soviet Union's Lenin Peace Prize. So let me say this. I didn't serve this country for nearly three decades, and I didn't take my oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, just to turn over our country and education of our kids over to a bunch of America-hating communists. So for those of you sitting up there, including you, Mr. Spence, if you want your kids and your and, or kids and your families to yes. praise a communist and learn about communism, then do it in your homes. Okay, this type of garbage is exactly why I believe we need to bring back the HUAC Act in Congress to root out this communism. And once again, in our country, we need to start with this, probably with some on the school board. But I know it's a waste of time for you to say you need to vote no on accepting these books for our children. But the only thing I can say is, because you, you're going to do it anyway, so the only thing I can say is November cannot come fast enough. About this time. 
up. Our next speaker is Rebecca Bragg. Please unmute. Welcome. Good morning or good evening, uh, Chairwoman Rye, uh, Dr. Spence, and school board members. Tonight, I just simply like to talk about that new English resource for elementary school, as many have spoken about tonight, obviously. But first, I want to thank you guys for providing the full, unfiltered, and unadulterated material to the public for review. The transparency is actually quite appreciated. And after two years of frustration in our community, I've concluded that communication is key. If COVID had any silver lining, it is that the shroud between school classrooms and parents has finally been removed and was finally able to feel welcome in the classroom. You see, in elementary school, I vowed to be that involved parent that showed up to everything and was engaged and supportive. And I viewed the school as my partner in providing a quality education to my children. I'm not the professional in teaching my children how to read, so I trusted the teachers to provide that instruction with all their certifications, knowledge, and professional skills. My trust in the teachers in the school was met with being rather unwelcomed in the classroom. I wanted to be there to help with parties and events and anything else I could do, and instead, we're met with security desks that stand between us and the classroom. And I'm not dismissing the value of security because it's important. But then I end up being told I'm a distraction or a disruption. And then I feel like I'm unwelcome unless it's a certain event in which you just simply want me to be there as free labor. And then of course, as we continue on to middle school, the trust continues to get broken with the communication with teachers as I hear less and less from them as I'm feeling even less welcome in the building. So I don't know what's going on past those big doors that my children would walk through each day. And all I can do is rely on the one side of stories my kids tell me when they get home. You know, yet throughout all of this and all of those frustrations, I still trusted the professionals. When my child wasn't getting the support that she needed and I felt like she was being, or I was being pushed against a wall in my efforts to advocate for her, I was put in my place as a parent who just doesn't know and doesn't understand. And I felt even more vulnerable and ineffective. And again, I wanted to trust the professionals. And then finally we had COVID and every single parent in Virginia Beach was able to step inside of a classroom unencumbered by security desk bouncers and administration roadblocks. Parents got to see what went on in the classroom for good or for bad. Could I have fought harder for the seat at the table to face my child's education before? Probably, but I really had no clue where to begin and no real resources to figure it out. I was young and just trying to figure out how to be a mom. But you know what I really wanna do here is conclude by saying that I wanna trust that the material you intend to show our kids here is going to be appropriate, but I find it hard sometimes seeing the full scope of what's proposed in this material. So my ask is this, take our feedback and listen to what the parents have said. Thank you. Madam Chair, that was our last speaker of the evening. Thank you, Madam Clerk, and to all our speakers. So this brings us to the information portion of our meeting. And we begin with Ms. Crystal Pate and a resolution regarding additional grant funding for fiscal year 2021-2022. And we're going to begin by reading the resolution, is my understanding. Um, Mrs. Anderson. Additional grant funding for fiscal year 2021-22. Whereas, the City of Virginia Beach's adopted budget ordinance for the current fiscal year appropriated funds to the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach, and whereas the schools have budgeted an amount of $204,198,866 in the current fiscal year, fiscal 2021-22, in the Category Grants Fund, and whereas this budgeted amount in the Category Categorical Grants Fund is $17,230,117 short of the amount needed to fund five new American Rescue Plan ARP awards and a proposed amendment to the Early Reading Initiative State Grant as outlined in House Bill 29, Senate Bill 29, and whereas examples of the proposed spending plan for the Early Reading Initiative State Grant includes tutoring and related instructional support in the classroom. And whereas examples of the proposed spending plans for the five ARP awards, Cor Coronavirus State and lo Local Physical Recovery Funds, ARP Unfinished Learning, 
ARP before and after school programs, ARP summer learning, and ARP homeless children and youth. That includes HVAC replacement and re renovations, stipends for reading and math teachers, instructional materials and supplies, additional instructional staffing before and after school, web-based STEM activities, transportation, summer school staffing, social emotional support through CHKD's bridge program, and case management and school supplies for homeless children and youth respectively. And whereas the school board of the city of Virginia Beach requests requests an additional appropriation of $17,230,117 into the categorical grants fund. And whereas appropriations of funds must be approved by the city council prior to the expenditure of funds by the school board of the city of Virginia Beach. Now therefore be it resolved that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach approves and affirms the necessary appropriation and recommended uses of these funds and be it further resolved that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach requests an additional appropriation of $17,230,117 into the categorical grants fund and be it finally resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes of this school board and the clerk of the school board is directed to deliver a copy of this resolution to the mayor, each member of the city council, the city manager, and the city clerk. Thank you, Mrs. Anderson. So, Ms. Pate, it's my understanding you'll, you'll provide a further explanation before we open it up for questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, the purpose of this resolution um, is in the third quarter of this fiscal year, we did receive five new American Rescue Plan grant awards, um, and that totaled approximately $15.8 million. When the fiscal year 2022 budget was adopted, that was not appropriated in the categorical grants fund. We do build in a contingency in that categorical grants fund of about $7.2 million. That takes into account we adjust budgets during the year as awards come in, um, actuals, and when carryover awards actually um, are finalized at the end of the fiscal year. So this, um, the 15.8 of that $17 million is needed in order to um, receive the appropriation, put the budget on the books, and allow us to expend those funds. About 1.4 million of that relates to the Early Reading Initiative Grant. It's a state grant. Um, General Assembly is still in special session, just beginning. Um, but both proposals on the House and the Senate side do increase that award substantially. Um, so we are anticipating that award to increase. And again, our contingency at 7.2 million, um, which has been um, reduced by adjusting other budgets this fiscal year, will not be able to absorb that again. We need that appropriation in order to, to up that award and put that on the books. Uh, before I open it up, can you re reiterate when you the seventeen million is coming from where? It's, it's we're requesting the city to appropriate those funds into the categorical grant funds account. Same thing when you go through budget development in that resolution, we ask for operating budget, we ask for categorical grant funds, and we ask for special revenue funds. It's the same idea. Is that we're just asking for that categorical grant funds to be have an additional appropriation in fiscal year twenty twenty two. Same process, just we need additional funding because of those grant awards came in after the budget was adopted. And because the General Assembly is increasing that state grant quite a bit, that was not included in our appropriations. And because it's not appropriated by the city yet, we are not legally allowed to spend those funds until the city appropriates those. So again, when you say they were awarded, by whom? They're, fe they're, our, they're federal awards. Um, they were application-based. Um, they came through. Um, Toward the end, the applications came out probably mid-year, and then the applications were done, and then the awards were granted. So we get awarded by the federal government on the ARP awards. The Early Reading Initiative is a state grant, so it comes through based on some, I don't have that in front of me, but there's based on different elements that actually awards that to um, divisions. It's in what our, our VDOE calc tool, so it has a state portion and a an corresponding local match portion. So the award is from the federal government. The American okay. Rescue Plan awards So can are. you explain for all our benefits what the role of city council is in this? Their responsibility as our government, as the legal entity, they are to appropriate the funds to the school division in order for us to expend those funds. If they do not appropriate it, we are not legally able to spend those mm -hmm. funds. Okay, Mrs. Manning, then Mrs. Anderson. Yeah, and I think you just kind of said what I was going to say. This isn't money that we're asking the city council to um, 
it's not extra money that we're asking them to fund for us. We have to have that money appropriated in order to receive it, basically, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and to spend that money. Correct. So it's money that we're going to allocate so that we can spend it, and we're going to be getting it back from the federal government and, and the, the state, state government through grants, yes, correct? correct. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Anderson. So what happens to that money if city council all of a sudden says, no, we're not going to do it? So on the American Rescue Plan, um, we are likely would have to cancel our application. They're reimbursement-based grants, so we would not expend any funds, and we would not ask reimbursement through the federal government for any of those awards. On the state grant, that money does come to us through payments. Right for many years, the state has um, carryover language that allows us to carry over those state grants. So we would spend up to the appropriation. There is an appropriation in fiscal year 2022 for that state grant. It's just not to the level at which we expect that to come in at. So we would be able to spend up to that appropriation in this fiscal year. Then likely that those monies would carry over if the language, if there was carryover provisions in the language for the state, which likely there will be. So could this be misrepresented as additional money that city council is appropriating for us? What, what I know, I know that. I'm just, I'm asking if someone says, well, this is additional money, you know, is that how they can misrepresent that? Or is that something that they could deny the appropriation? Right. Uh, they could. Yes. Okay. So we just want to make sure this is not additional money that city council has to come up with. I think the distinction, Mrs. Anderson, probably is that somebody might misconstrue this to be additional local dollars coming from right. the city. Right. Right. And that these aren't, these aren't local dollars. These are grant funds specifically allocated for this purposes from the state and federal government. And we just need city council to approve this so that we can utilize those grants. Yes, Correct? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Mrs. Riggs. Have we ever had grants come in like this after before? Is this <clears throat> a first time? The only time I've ever seen this happen before was when we were in the ARA phase, when we had the recession. And what happened in that respect was the carryovers, um, because it was an awful lot of infusion of money, not as much as it's been infused this time, but the carryover amounts that were estimated to go in the next fiscal year were underestimated. And at that point, we did go back to city council and ask for that additional money for those carryovers of our grants. Were they granted to us? Yes. So we had no problem? No. What are your thoughts on this? Should be no problem. They're, I mean, it's legitimate. We, we applied for grants. We got them. They're, most of them are related to the American Rescue Plan. State grant, I mean, they give that to us based on our needs and what they believe that program needs um, from an educational standpoint. And how does it affect the city one way or the other? They, it's part of their appropriation. So they'll have to, you know, it's just part of their appropriation like they do when they do. So it's, it's going to be shown in their books and then off their budget. But it is grant, like Dr. Smith said, it is grant months. It's not operating budget. Okay, thank you. And before Mrs. Franklin, just to clarify, so the reason this is being presented now as a separate resolution is it didn't come through in time for before our budget approval. Correct. And or, or it would have been incorporated in that. Correct. And we knew we were going to have to come back to school board and city council for this oh. appropriation. So we only wanted to have to do this one time this fiscal year for this for this fiscal year for these items. Like for the the HVAC grant that's referenced on here, that's a $13 million grant. That grant has been amended and will be amended again because there were many HVAC projects that were on ESSER 3, and that grant has been amended several times to allow for our compensation, retention, and recruitment initiatives. And so those HVAC projects are being reprioritized and those have to be amended. Just an example of that. So we knew we were gonna have to come back. That grant wasn't ready to spend, so we wanted to be able to come back all at one time and only do this request once. Okay, Mrs. Franklin. Okay, so thank you, Ms. May. Uh, so just to clarify, what we are voting on for this resolution is that we are voting to take it in front of the City Council for approval for appropriation. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. So I think it's fair to say you would be available for questions anytime between now and the next meeting when this will be back for consent. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. And now we have our techn technology and career education, Carl Perkins, school year 23 grant. Welcome, Dr. Lockett. Dr. Lockett, could you turn the mic on? Red button on the bottom. <laughs> we got you. <laughs> I, I'm showing a little 
<laughs> lack of technical skill, I apologize. Uh, <laughs> good evening. <laughs> Good evening, Chairwoman Rye, Vice Chairwoman Melnick, members of the board, and Dr. Spence. I am Dr. Sarah Lockett, Director of Technical and Career Education. As a requirement of the Carl D. Perkins Five Grant, we are here tonight to present for the board's information the proposed local plan for budgeting grant expenditures for next school year. The Strengthening Career and Technical Education of the 21st Century Act authorizes funding for Perkins Five and reflects our nation's more than 100 year federal commitment to technical and career education programs. The funding allocated to localities is critical to ensuring our programs are prepared to meet the ever-changing needs of learners and employers in our city and across the nation. In compliance with the act, Virginia Beach City Public Schools must approve and submit a Perkins 5 local plan and budget for career and technical education annually. Based on requirements authorized by the standards of quality in Perkins 5, the school division must submit the application for 2022, 23, no later than April 29th, 2022. Tonight's presentation supports continuing Perkins 5 funding for programs providing over 35,000 student seats in 1,688 technical and career course sections offered to students face-to-face -face online and through dual enrollment. Our TCE staff continue to work closely with teachers, students, parents, local industry, Virginia Beach Economic Development, the Hampton Roads Workforce Council, and our General Advisory Council for Technical and Career Education to ensure that their input is reflected in the budget and plan presented to you this evening. In addition to the local plan and budget, Perkins 5 usually requires localities to conduct local needs assessments to evaluate program structure and implementation that impact negotiated rates of student performance. The impact of spending outlined in this year's plan will be measured by federally identified performance measures. Academic achievement is measured using SOL and end of course exams for reading, mathematics and science. Technical skill attainment is measured using student competency records. Attainment of industry recognized post-secondary credentials is measured with our credential exams from the state approved list that meet both local industry needs and satisfy graduation requirements for students who need a credential to graduate. Non-traditional career preparation is measured using enrollment data from the secondary enrollment demographic form and completion measured using course completion data. Participation in work-based learning activities during high school is measured by student participation in our co-op, COE, mentorship, internship, and service learning experiences. And finally, secondary school completion and post-secondary placement is measured using course completion rates, graduation rate, and transition rate, and that's to higher ed, the military, the workforce. Each year, Carl D. Perkins includes goals for improvement in our career and technical programs based on this performance data. Last year, we focused on recruiting and retaining students who represent a non-traditional gender in their career pathway. That is defined as 25% or less of the industry's workforce coming from a specific gender group. Examples include, but are not limited to, recruiting more male students to enroll in courses like dental assisting or teaching electives, or connecting more female students with our engineering or computer science options. The division saw a roughly 2% increase in enrollment of students whose gender was classified as non-traditional last year. This year, the plan continues to work on increasing the number of non-traditional students selected for our career and technical, that, that select our career and technical programs. A new measure that Virginia Beach is meeting but will continue to be closely followed is the number of students who complete a work-based learning experience before leaving high school. Even with last year's pandemic restrictions, 15.64% of our CTE program completers took part in a work-based learning experience related to their CTE program of study. This benchmark is also connected to the upcoming College Career and Civic Readiness Index Accreditation Standard that is supported in the local plan and budget presented for your information this evening. This slide breaks down our local plan for spending an estimated, the estimated grant funds for 22-23. The Virginia Department of Education has not yet released official allocations by locality for next year, and divisions are asked to prepare a budget based on level funding from the current year. Our recommended budget based on the estimated allocation is summarized in the chart. As stipulated in the Perkins 5 legislation, up to 5% of funds may be used for costs to administer the grant. The portion, 
avail available is split between indirect costs and test proctors. These funds go to the Office of Business Services and the 2% for indirect cost are the funds that go to the Office of Business Services for administering their grant. The remaining 3% will be used to fund the proctors who deliver and administer industry credential exams each year. Perkins 5 also requires that localities use funds for equipment purchases and professional development. The proposed local plan and budget includes a return to pre-pandemic allocations for professional development activities for teachers and administrators and other technical others involved in technical and career programming for the last two years when professional development was more limited unused funds were reallocated to equipment and resources for our career and technical classrooms the proposed plan is optimistic about our our ability to once again provide rich opportunities for professional learning with the same contingencies in place professional development efforts for the 22-23 school year will again focus on training tied to program accreditation, work-based learning, and courses recommended by industry partners on our General Advisory Council. Virginia Beach Schools allocates the bulk of our Perkins 5 funding to equipment and lab resources that allow our students to prepare for diverse career pathways. Just over $470,000 is budgeted for equipment and instructional materials at our secondary schools and specialty centers. These items include technology, software, machinery, and instructional resources. Student leadership development is the next item on the budget. This line refers to support for our co-curricular student organizations, including DECA, Educators Rising, FBLA, Skills USA, and TSA. Career and technical student organizations are an integral and active part of each career and technical program. Although spending in this area was minimal during the last two years, we are seeing a robust participation in state leadership competitions this spring. Just last weekend, almost 100 high school students traveled with their teachers to rest in Virginia to complete, compete in the FBLA State Leadership Conference. Similar trends are happening with the technology student organization, as you saw tonight, DECA, Educators Rising, and other co-curricular clubs. The proposed 22-23 budget includes $105,000 to support students who face barriers as members of special populations to compete in these events. Funding for a portion of our industry credential exams that are given to our high school students comes from Perkins 5. This funding is, increased, is increasing in next year's budget to an estimated $80,000. Students are working on expanding, um, schools are working on expanding credentialing opportunities to connect students with key industries in our region. The plan also continues to support STEM initiatives and efforts to recruit girls into STEM fields. The final line in the proposed budget represents a category that was new last year. Approximately $121,000 is recommended to maintain the work-based learning specialist position created in 2021 and fund related activities that will help connect every student with an internship, mentorship, service learning project, or other work-based experience before they leave high school. This funding remains important to our work to support the College Career and Civi Civic Readiness Index Accreditation Standard. The plan presented for consideration this evening was crafted with input from members of our General Advisory Council and has been approved by that body. Thank you for your consideration, and at this time, if you have any questions, I'm ready to answer those. Colleagues? All right, we, we know we, this never grows old, though, to see all the, the great initiatives happening. And, and, it is, and it is important to note that it is spread among all our high schools, not limited to the two specialty centers, as, as you noted as evidenced by two of our student honorees and our, this evening. And our middle schools as well. Yeah. Good point. Well, thank you very much. Okay. All right, I will proceed and read tonight's consent agenda. Uh, the following items are presented for approval. A, the 2022-23 Special Education Annual Plan Part B Flow Through Application. B, the new course proposal of Journalism 4. C, recommendation of general contractor for one base site elementary school roof replacement, two, Green Run, Green Run High School tennis court, 
three Ocean Lakes High School roof and partial HVAC replacement, and D, the following policy review recommendations. One, policy 7-5, news division-wide and individual school. Two, policy 7-14, advertising in schools. Three, policy 7-40, performance of students. Four, policy-741, contests for students. Five, policy 745, recognition of students and staff by the school board. D6 is policy 752, use of school board equipment and use of school buses. Seven is policy 755, fees for use of school facilities. And eight is policy 756, concession stands on school property. So I now call for a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Mrs. Hughes in a second. Mrs. Holtz. Okay. All in favor, sh please show a raised hand. Ms. Owens, how do you vote? I vote yes. Thank you. Vice Chair Melnick, how do you vote? I vote yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have a unanimous vote. The motion did pass. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And now the action portion of the agenda, and we begin with the personnel report and administrative appointments. Motion to approve. Mrs. Hughes in a second. Mrs. Anderson. Okay, uh, discussion? All right, hearing none. Uh, all in favor, show a raised hand, please. Ms. Owens, how do you vote? I vote yes. Thank you, Vice Chair Melnick. How do you vote? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have a unanimous vote. The motion did pass. Thank you. Okay, so we do, Dr. Spence does have some administrative appointments to announce. I do. Thank you, Madam Chair. We'd like to recognize two, and unfortunately, neither could be here this evening, but we'll start with Maureen Finelli. You all will recognize Maureen. She has served as a teacher in Philadelphia, but also since 2004 as a teacher, math specialist, instructional specialist in Virginia Beach, as well as an assistant principal at Luxford Elementary School. Most recently has been serving as an assistant principal at Pembroke Meadows Elementary School. We're pleased this evening you've accepted our recommendation for her to serve as the next principal of Salem Elementary School. Congratulations, Ms. Finelli. And we'd also like to recognize Robert Jameson. You all recognize Mr. Jameson. He has served as an algebra, began his career as an algebra readiness tutor at Cox High School and an SOL tutor. He's been a school counselor, school counseling department chair. He's been an instructional specialist in the Office of Guidance Services, most recently been serving as coordinator of guidance in the Office of Student Support Services. This evening, we're pleased that you've accepted our recommendation for her, him to serve as the next executive director of the Student Support Services office in of student support services in the office of student support services congratulations to mr jameson yeah finally. and um, i'm not sure and I, I hope we'll have an opportunity to um, thank her but the reason he's stepping into that position you may know that alvita has indicated that she'll be retiring and we want to give her a quick shout out for the incredible work that she's done in that role as well that's it madam chair Thank you, and, and as always, our best wishes for success for the two new appointments, as well as honoring Dr. Green's service. All right, second action item, textbook adoption, secondary English. Uh, to open it up for further discussion, I call for a motion to approve. Mrs. Riggs, a second. Mrs. Anderson. All right, and welcome. Dr. Rogers. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Rye. Good evening, Chairwoman Rye, Vice Chair Melnick, School Board members, and Dr. Spence. This evening, I will provide you with additional information to accompany the information that was shared with you at your February 22nd board meeting. And this evening, I'm joined by several of my colleagues, Mrs. Angela Siders, Executive Director of Secondary Teaching and Learning, both of our Secondary English Coordinators, Cami Baderson Jacob, Brittany Kearns, as well as staff from Actively Learn, and particularly Mrs. Jessica Bell, who will provide you with a brief demonstration of the recommended resource 
actively learn to better assist you in answering questions that have been raised since the last school board presentation and certainly what we've heard this evening. So I wanted to start off why the need for a digital textbook to begin with. In June of 2021, our latest secondary English textbook contract ended. And since the start of this school year, our secondary English teachers have relied solely on open educational resources to support learning. They've used classroom sets of literature te textbooks as well as hard copies of novels. Our literacy coaches and English teachers across the district have repeatedly exp expressed a need for an effective and interactive reading platform for our students to accompany and better utilize our one-to-one -one computer access for students. So they've been using things like Google to supplement their resources, as well as sometimes teachers pay teachers and other online educational resources. So we have a need to support our teachers with a digital resource that's trusted, that's vetted, and aligned with our curriculum and the Virginia Standards of Learning. So through this process, we sought to gain a digital textbook resource that offers a variety of texts for teacher selection, as well as our students to use. We wanted to use texts that include classical and temporary fiction, as well as nonfiction, poetry, drama, and certainly a rich media resource bank. We wanted a resource that's interactive, that has embedded active reading strategies, for example, pair-to-pair -pair text reading to leverage our one-to-one -one computer access for students. We also wanted a resource that's customizable and allows the division to curate text that align well with our current grade level curriculum units. The resource should be user friendly for our teachers as well as our students and easily adaptable to our learning management platform. And of course, we wanted to make sure that the resource is aligned to the Virginia standards of learning. So I also wanted to point out what the differences are between a digital textbook resource as compared to a physical textbook resource. So I'll pause a moment and let you just look at the slide. So just to provide some clarity relative to what a digital resource is and what it is not. A digital textbook resource is a web-based product that's both customizable and interactive for students as well as for teachers. Unlike a physical hard copy textbook, a digital textbook resource is continually updated by the vendor. And in most instances, they have resources that are easily editable by our teachers as well as our district instructional leaders. And while physical textbook require, in many instances, long-term contracts, for example, our last contract lasted seven years, digital textbook resources offer short-term contracts, anywhere from one to three years, so that they can be extended as requested. And additionally, it's important to note that online add-on resources for physical textbooks, more often than not, are static in nature and don't allow the level of interactivity that digital textbook resources do. So on the next slide, I'm gonna show you a slide that should be very familiar to you, and it's a slide that we show every time we offer a textbook adoption process. And if you take note to the very top square, the research is done on OERs or online educational resources. Of course, we look for materials that are free first, and when we don't find that, then we shift to the RFP or bid processes, which is what we did in this instance. And then a committee is formulated, and they bring forth two recommendations, which is what we did back in February. And the top two choices are presented to you for approval. So the top two resources that were selected by committee are actively learn. And we'll talk a lot about that today, which is the, the resources being recommended by the committee. And then the second is into literature. Committees that were formulated consisted of 13 members, 10 of which were teachers. There were two school-based literacy staff and then one college professor. And the manner in which we solicit participation for committee members, we put out a principal's me packet memo, and then teachers submit applications and that are supported by the principal to actually serve on the committee. The committee had four considerations as they review the resources, the first of which is to consider our curricular goals. The second is the usability for our students as well as for teachers. 
And then the support, it's able to provide for all of our students to include our students with disabilities, our English language learners, our uh, gifted students, as well as any other student that may need support, as well as the supports that are provided to our teachers to help them better teach the lessons and activities that are in our curriculum. We also consider equity in the resource and multiple perspectives. So there's not just one pers perspective being presented in the resource. I also want to thank those committee members who served and spent a lot of time vetting the resources and providing feedback. And I also like to thank the 125 members of our community and stakeholders who provided input on, the t on their top two choices electronically. So I just want to point out a little bit of the information that was shared. So of the 125 stakeholder input, we had 52% of them indicated actively learn as their top choice. 65 of them selected that. 40% selected into literature as their first choice. And then we had 8% or 10 respondents who indicated neither choice for a multitude of reasons that I'll share momentarily. If I can direct your attention to the blue chart where it goes a little bit more into detail, we had 12 students who provided input for the resources. Mostly all of them selected actively learn as their first choice. We had 83 staff, staff members, which consisted of building level administrators. We had teachers, we had instructional staff of, of literacy to provide input. We had 54% or 45 of them indicated actively learn as the first choice. And we were fortunate that we had 15 parents and grandparents who provided input. Of those, 47% or seven of them ind indicated actively learn as their first choice. And we also had community members who did not indicate that they had students in the school district. Nevertheless, they certainly provided us with input. And of those, we had seven or 58% of them indicated neither resource should be recommended for a multitude of reasons, most of which they had concerns about the appropriateness of the resources based on what they were able to review. And the second was the cost associated with both resources. We did have three professors who provided input, and I want to point out it was evenly distributed. The one that indicated neither resource indicated both were great resources. However, the professor wanted to honor the work of the teachers who brought forth the recommendation of the resource um, at hand. So those were the well, it was the breakdown of the input from our 125 stakeholders, and I do want to thank them for participating. So I'll just share briefly a little about Into Literature, which was the second option that was brought forth. Into Literature is an all-inclusive English language arts program. Well, what I mean by all-inclusive is that the resource does offer support for our teachers and students with skills-based activities, assessments, and adaptations for students with disabilities. Into Literature is a digital textbook that's divided up by grade level and thematic units. And while the resource is all-inclusive, the Committee of Teachers did identify some limitations of the product, including that it resembles a traditional textbook. It's not customizable to support our needs, and it, they found it difficult to navigate for the end user, albeit our students. So most of the time that I'll spend for the rest of the presentation is on the active learn, actively learn resource, which is again committee recommended. Actively learn is the committee's top recommendation and brings interaction and deep engagement to our students' understanding of classic literature, contemporary fiction, as well as high interest fiction. The digital textbook resource includes well over 24,000 full novels and plays, short stories, and poems that we have the option to customize in a district library in order to meet our students' needs. It also houses more than 650 news and high interest articles, thus not allowing our teachers to have to resort to online resources like Google and Teachers Pay Teachers. Our neighboring school division, Chesapeake City Public Schools, uses this resource, Actively Learn, as their primary text resource, as does Chesterfield County Public Schools. Both of those school divisions report strong teacher satisfaction 
worth the resource. So I know I have Mrs. Bell joining us to provide you with a demonstration, so I won't go into great detail about the benefits of actively learn, but I'll just point out some of the benefits that the Committee of Teachers found. They found actively learn to be a highly be highly engaging for our students and extremely easy for use for teachers. Because of its user-friendly platform and ease of use, teachers will be able to collaborate with other teachers in the, their buildings as well as building level literacy leaders to easily integrate in their classroom instruction as well as integrate with Canvas. And Mrs. Bell will share with you how that integration works. And finally, one important feature that I don't think was understood by many of our stakeholders via email that I received over the last several weeks, and certainly with what we heard this evening, is that our district library, we have the option to customize our district library with grade level text that are aligned to our standards and are age appropriate. So in short, our students will only have access to, to text that their teacher assigns them. Another benefit is the support that it provides for our students. Actively Learn does provide a variety of support for students to include providing access tools that, tools that assist them with vocabulary and context. And I know you can't see it here and Ms. Bell will share with you what that means while they're reading. It provides level of annotation. It provides audio support that is extremely helpful for students with disabilities and even text to speech that translates in over 100 languages, which will be an absolute support for our English language learners. And in consultation with Actively Learn staff, the company does strive to include multiple perspectives within the context of the text. So depending on the topic or the text that's selected, this might be done by including a counter argument within that text and providing a link to text that is written by an author with a different perspective or even offering questions and suggestions to help teachers to facilitate discussion. Relative to access to content, I want to reiterate that relative to students and staff having access to all of the content that that resource that the resource offers, again, I have to reinforce that the fact that Actively Learn offers a customizable library that will allow us to curate collections of pre-approved texts, as well as resources within the context of that platform. The pre-approved collections will include texts that are aligned to the Virginia Beach City Public Schools English curriculum. And this resource is not a curriculum, it's just that, it's a resource, as well as alignment with the Virginia Standards of Learning. The current curriculum units that they offer and that our stakeholders had access to while reviewing are optional examples and are absolutely not required for us to use as Virginia Beach City Public Schools. In fact, the vendor has shared with me that the suggested curriculum units that are shown on the resource can be removed if we would like that. I also want to emphasize and actively learn our students only have access to resources that our teachers assign them to. And our teachers work collaboratively in professional learning groups to decide what is and what is not taught with our students. And Mrs. Bell, again, will share what that looks like. So I want to point out some of the concerns and some clarification. And again, I'll rely on Mrs. Bell to share some more specifics relative to the resource that I think will be helpful for all of us is the appropriateness of the resources as well as the units. Again, the district library is absolutely customizable. Multiple perspectives. One of the interesting things, not necessarily interesting because I think that happens in many instances with outside vendors, is that they have an auditor to ensure that the content is culturally responsive, historically accurate, as well as includes a multi multiple perspectives. Relative to poll questions, I think we use poll loosely as it, they use poll loosely as the resource is concerned. And I would akin it to having an introductory question to engage students in the learning. Those questions that are posed within the context of the resource are optional and they're absolutely completely editable for student engagement. And I need to re reiterate that data are not stored or shared within the context of those questions. So for example, 
In a traditional textbook, many instances at the beginning of a unit or a chapter, you have engaging questions that students can be asked. This is a digital resources, resource that puts those in a digital format. And again, those questions can be edited. The read aloud option is placed there as a support feature, again, to assist our students with reading challenges. It's not there to serve as a crutch for our students, but many students prefer to have stories read to them aloud to better help them with comprehension. The expense, and I'll share what the expense is moment in, at the next slide, but the cost is commensurate to other resources that we've purchased in the, in the school division and certainly commensurate with our last resource. And then most recently, relative to safety, the short version is that the resource is COPA and FERPA compliant. And I've had multiple exchanges over the last couple of days with their legal department, and they absolutely emphatically state that they do not share student information with third party resources, as we heard earlier today. The estimated implementation costs for approximately 35,300 students are on the screen in front of you in the blue chart. And as you can see, actively learn, the annual cost is relatively $18 per student over the course of a three-year contract. Into literature is more expensive at $29 per student over the course of a three-year contract on average. And if you look direct your attention to the green area. We have our last resource, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt resource that our students have currently. We have classroom sets of it. The cost associated with that was approximately $18, it was exactly $18.71 per student over the course of the seven years. So as you can see, the cost is similar. So with that, I am going to turn the Next part of the presentation over to Mrs. Bell and give her a minute to transition to provide you with a live demonstration. And of course, we'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we welcome you. Very different experience typing on the screen away up there. <laughs> Thank you so much for letting us talk a little bit about Actively Learn. I was a classroom teacher for 19 years. I used Actively Learn for seven years, middle and high school, which are the grade levels you're looking at. Um, so certainly grades six through 12. I found it to be um, a really easy to use resource that was also really engaging for my students. You'll see I did just sign in, or I'm getting ready to sign into Virginia. So I do want you to know that all of these resources um, are able to be selected by state standard as well, which is one of the ways I really enjoyed using this program in my classroom. So when we think about what Actively Learn is, it is not a curriculum. It is not a textbook. It is a collection of curated digital resources that school districts choose the order in which they assign and work with those, student, those resources for their students. Students cannot see anything that a teacher has not assigned to them. So as we look at exploring some of these different resources, you'll be able to see that teachers and districts hold all of the power and actively learn. So these are designed to be curated resources that teachers can access they're able to sort through the content, they're able to access grade level, filter by assignment type, by lexile band, or even by standard. So I'm able to go in and pull my 10th grade standards. I might even select a specific standard to see which resources I need to cover. Um, and so I'm even able to go in and cross-reference 
all those different standards, and then pull resources that are going to help me meet the standard. Again, we're not necessarily looking um, at some of those curriculum units. I work with districts all over the country. No one uses the curriculum units as written. They are examples of what it could look like in a scope and sequence. The district library is designed to be a place for you to organize the resources that you and your teachers choose to use aligned to your curriculum map. So the landing page that we just land on represents a fraction of the resources in Actively Learn. As Dr. Rogers shared with you, there's over 24,000 different titles. Um, but let's take a look at the polls. I know there were some questions about that. Um, I do want to show you right away that all of the resources in Actively Learn are designed to be customizable by the teacher to make sure they match the instructional needs of the teacher and the students in the classroom. So teachers can click this customize button and then they're able to go in and adjust all of these things. So maybe we want um, our students to annotate. So I'm going to ask them to add two notes to the margin. Oops. And then I can click save. All of these resources then will appear to the student as if the, teacher, the students don't have any way to know that, like, which resources the teachers have customized and which they haven't. I do want to show you very quickly that I can edit the poll questions or I can even remove these. So I have the option to delete those and then there is no poll question. If your district chooses to say, hey, we want to use the actively learned resources, but we want to remove the pre-reading question to just eliminate any question about whether or not that data is shared. It's not. We don't share any data at all. Um, you are able to customize every resource. You're able to customize the questions. You're able to add those margin notes. You're able to add in all those resources. You'll note that mine say Mrs. Bell, right? That's because all of these resources are customized to the teacher. So. Dr. Spence's would say Mr. Spence, Dr. Rogers would say Mr. Rogers. Your, your students believe that the teachers are the experts in all of these pieces of information, all these content selections. I do, let's take a look at some more resources. I do want to make sure we take a look at some of those text resources. So when we take a look at our book pairings, for example, we're able to look at some of those classics that we teach. Um, we want to make sure teachers have access to resources that are really going to help them um, access those texts, build connections for students, and also not spend a lot of time searching through resources. The novels that are built out with instruction contain annotations and they contain teaching notes for our students. We want our teachers and students to be able to have a really rich experience in these resources. So I'm going to go to chapter one of The Great Gatsby, for example. Again, we have the ability to remove that poll. Let me go ahead and do that right now so you can see just how easy that is again. The, annot the notes in the, the annotations, right, those notes in the margin are designed to help students access some of those pieces of context that they might not understand. We also offer scaffolds like accommodations and modifications so teachers aren't spending time doing that. One of the things that we do is we remove the distractors on those multiple choice questions. So those students who have an IEP or an ILP would only receive three of the four answer choices, really changing the amount of time that teachers have to spend customizing resources for students with needs. We also offer extra help notes for those students. Again, those students may be in MTSS or RTI students that are English language development students or students um, that receive special education services can have some additional scaffolds. Those notes would only appear to those students. And then we tend to end pieces in Actively Learn with open-ended response essay questions. And those also have extra support for those students who need extra support in the classroom, again, with little to no lift from the teacher. So they're able to teach the resource without having to spend time customizing it for all of those, those individual students. But let's take a look at the student preview because I know there were some questions um, about what that student experience looks like in Actively Learn. So I removed the poll, so you'll see there's no poll. It's going to give me some notes about what it is that I need to read. Um, and now I have ways to access support in Actively Learn. I can turn on that read aloud feature in the top right hand corner if I'm a student who needs read aloud support. I'm also able to use my mouse and then highlight any one word at a time. 
if I need definition and like dictionary support in context, I'm able to provide that without indicating to the teacher or other students that I need additional support in the classroom without interrupting the instruction. I'm able to understand what those words mean and move on. I can also have the audio, the audio support for that. As a student, I'm able to customize text just like the teacher and annotate. I can annotate for the text as we look at some of those high school students and our AP resources and we really want our students to practice annotating and making connections to the text, they're able to do that. Students are also able to highlight and have the audio support in smaller sections of the text or translate into one of over 100 languages as Dr. Rogers indicated. And then we do have authentic text to speech as well. So students who might speak another language at home or, oh, I really wanted Spanish there, <laughs> or who might um, not be as literate in that first language but might have that auditory support or able to have that support as well. En mis años más jóvenes y vulnerables, mi padre me dio un consejo que really useful for helping our students that are especially secondary students um, that speak a second language make that connection between the auditory language they can understand and the written English that is the primary language of instruction. We can also take a look at the way students can access support. Um, students can also access support in that top right hand corner, in the top left hand corner. Actually my margins are a little off over here. There we go. Oh. There we go. In my text settings, the student can adjust the margins and spacing, the sizing. They can adjust the background color if you've got students that are sensitive um, to computer glare. And we also have dyslexic settings. And these are research-based best practices to help students with dyslexia engage in an electronic platform. What I love about this is that this is just one layer of support so my students can still access all of the other layers of support as they are working with any of the text and actively learn. So the district library is one of the things that Dr. Rogers really mentioned, and this is where our school districts um, spend time curating their resources. The scope and sequence curriculum units that we said were suggested, right, our examples can be turned off. You do not have to use them. We work with no school districts. No two school districts are the same. So they were actually developed at the request of customers who wanted to see what a scope and sequence could look like. Realistically, our customers and our school districts that we partner with build out a scope and sequence curriculum unit that looks like this, that allows them to organize their resources in a way that's equitable for the teachers, honors the district curriculum and the teachers' resources and choices that they'd like to make. Again, students don't see anything in our platform unless a teacher has assigned it to them. I also understand that you're moving to Canvas. So actually your students will never even sign in to actively learn. Students will access all of this content through Canvas as the learning management system. It will appear in Canvas. I will show you that in just one second. I do wanna show you before we do that exactly how you can customize some of those questions. I know we talked about that. Let me turn off my dyslexic filter. Your teachers are able to really make sure that those instructional resources meet their needs. So they are able to go in and edit all of those questions. Everything is aligned to standards and DOK level as well. You're even able to populate, <coughs> excuse me, a standards-based gradebook. So if your teachers go in and customize or your curriculum committee customizes resources and aligns and edits those standards to your Virginia learning standards, then those will populate in your grade reporting. Teachers can also go in and add questions to really make sure that these resources meet their instructional needs. Again, anything that I go ahead and adjust here will populate in my grade reporting. So if I'd like to add a question or maybe my students are getting ready to take their state tests and I want to make sure they have more practice with technology enhanced items, I'm able to add those resources in, align them to my standards, share them with my colleagues, put them in the district library, and my students can only see that when I have assigned it to them. Let's take a look at Canvas. So you can see what the student experience will be. When we log into Canvas, obviously this is what a published course looks like in Canvas. 
Um, from the teacher experience, actively learn will appear on the left here on the side. It's a full integration, but we know students interact with resources in Canvas from their assignments page. So you can see these resources. I've got my syllabus and course expectations. These are actually resources in Actively Learn. So you can see students aren't browsing my catalog. Students aren't clicking on those curriculum units. Students can't see anything that a teacher hasn't assigned to them in Canvas. I'm going to click on this Langston Hughes poem. It's actually going to go ahead and open it for me. And then I'm able to access my text, but at no time is a student browsing our library? Are students only able to access that resource that you have very intentionally selected for your students to interact with? The, there is a full Canvas integration, so that'll populate not only for the students, but that means for my teachers as they go in and pick those resources, as they assign them into Actively Learn, that there's even a grade pass back, so it'll integrate fully. Any, um, Dr. Rogers? Yeah. Perfect. I'm going to go ahead and exit this and put it back on the home page. Thank you, Mrs. Bell. Uh, at this time, I have a team host of uh, folks who are certainly uh, staying ready to answer any questions that you may have that I may not have complete answers for. Yes, Mrs. Franklin. Okay. Oh. Miss, we have our cue here. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm taking over your meeting. So. We have Miss. We have Mrs. The principal. Sorry. It's okay. We have Mrs. Anderson and then Mrs. Franklin. All right, and then Mrs. Hughes after Miss Franklin. So, um, my, my first question is: uh, I want to reiterate this. You've said it once, but I want to reiterate it. Um, that this program is for secondary students? Yes, ma'am. 6 through 12? Not elementary, correct? correct? That's correct. Okay, so yes, there was one misconception out there tonight when yes, they started talking about, you know, things that little children would see or hear. Um, and then it was made very clear just now in that, you know, this is customizable to the classroom, not just to Virginia Beach, but to the classroom. And so it's customizable. The teacher can customize it, and children are not going to see anything that the teacher has not assigned. And that's very important for people to understand as well. Um, um, I've got a couple. I've got them in order here. <laughs> uh, and it was pointed out that um, Chesapeake has been using this. This um, re these resources has yes. been using this. Do you, uh, and Chesterfield. For how long do you know how long? So Chesapeake has been, this is our second year uh, that they've been using it. And, um, you know, they've not had any issues with uh, with using it. Of okay. course, you know, you have you know, some teachers that would prefer having the uh, traditional textbook because, you know, some people just, I like the way books feel. I like the way they smell, you know. So if I listen to books and I also purchase the book at the same time. So we have, you know, a mixed bag of that as well. So um, you might be able to answer this, but one of the things that was brought out tonight about was about uh, someone named Angela Davis. How is her name associated with this English uh, resource? Uh, so I believe it's referring to an article, and Miss Bell may be able to better speak to that uh, than could you? I. Could you? Yeah. She's interviewed. In could, come to the mic, please. Yeah. So I want parents to hear this because I think they feel that we don't really hear them and that we don't really listen to their comments, but we do listen to their comments. And I'm, I'm trying to clarify some things so that people don't think that we're uh, a bunch of devils up here uh, choosing uh, resources that, um, you know, that are bad for our children. So, Correct. Yes, there's one resource that is she is reference as she is interviewed by someone in one resource dr rogers pointed out there are over twenty four thousand novels short stories plays plus 650 articles again if we don't want students to interact with any article the one article that refers to angela davis in the catalog we just simply want to sign it right okay um and how are the surveys you, you indicated that the surveys can that that people talk about the surveys can be customized and yes. um to a particular classroom, or they can be eliminated completely. Is that correct? Yes, that's one hundred percent correct. Okay, and and Dr. Rogers, would our um, English 
um, curriculum specialists that we have, would they um, have suggestions for our teachers to possibly uh, for, for each for like nine weeks or each peer, each quarter or whatever? So yeah, abs absolutely. Yes, ma'am. What we generally do is work very closely with, with our teachers and collaborate in PLCs. And during those PLCs is where we make decisions about what is and what is not taught. And um, the plan is to make sure that our, our DTAL staff are working very closely with the vendor to identify the resources that our literacy leaders and coaches and teachers have indicated um, that there's interest in and in making sure that those materials are aligned to our existing curriculum. So yes, ma'am. And, and I want to reiterate, we can customize this to our needs. Yes, ma'am. And to our uh, SOLs and to our uh, Virginia Beach objectives, for, for example, correct? Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay. that's correct. I, I, thank you. I, I, I may reserve the rest of my questions for later. Hi, Mrs. Franklin. Okay, thank you, Dr. Rogers, and thank you for your time that you've spent uh, with me this week, just kind of helping me go through this. So um, life is dragging me into the digital age, uh, kicking and screaming. I still use a checkbook. I still love a book, um, you know, hardcover book. And so, you know, my uh, brother-in-law was the CFO for a large media company, and he often said, and this is probably a question for Miss Bell, actually, but... Um, he often said that paper and people are the biggest costs when you're putting out a newspaper, for example, um, or any. So we had actually talked, and this might, I, I might actually need you, Jessica Bell, if that's okay. I'm sorry. Um, but I, I, went in, uh, I want to just kind of discuss the cost, because that was initially my question, too. We are not having these heavy uh, textbooks that are full of paper and people to have to organize and put all this together. Um, why is the cost in the millions to have the... Now, I'm going to tell you, I, I see that this re resource is amazing. It's got all kinds of good stuff that I, I probably wouldn't know how to use. But, but um, you know, it, so can you just explain why the cost is so high? Well, it's $18 per student. It's $18 a student per year, and a majority of that cost actually um, goes to our relationships with major publishing companies. They, we do pay gotcha. a royalty fee every Royalties. time they access one of those pieces. Okay, and then also um, one other thing that I wanted to ask you as well is just the um, uh, when it comes to the polling questions, you had actually said that um, that they can be removed, so mm -hmm. I like that. Um, the privacy, oh, and uh, there, there was one other question before I forget. Uh, someone had mentioned that Actively Learn, um, Actively Learn was only given a 1.9 rating. When I actually looked it up, the, what they were referring to is the Active 3000, which is a learning center in New Jersey. Are you in any way tied with that learning center in New Jersey? With the Chief 3000? Yeah, the Chief 3000 is part one of our parent companies. We actually are in the McGraw Hill portfolio now. As of November 1st, we are a member of the McGraw Hill family of solutions. McGraw, okay. And it's a 130 year publishing career yes. in the education okay. field. Yes. Okay, I, I just wanted to make sure I understood the relationship there. Um, and then, um, in terms of the uh, the privacy, um, you know, we're, so the polling questions literally don't go anywhere. Is that what you're telling me? They don't go anywhere. They're designed to help students understand that the people sitting next to them might have a different opinion than they do. They can be totally removed by the classroom. They can totally be removed by the district. That's a choice. We don't share any data. We don't have any ads. It doesn't get reported anywhere. It's literally designed. It doesn't have any names. Students can't see who answer what. It's literally designed to be a discussion piece to help students get in, interested in a topic and understand that people that they interact with every day have different ideas. So it'd be like a, a teacher asking a question, a leading question at the beginning 100%, of the class. percent, except okay. it lowers the effective filter since students know they can answer honestly and not have anyone realize who said it, oh, right? really helps them kind of explore that. Gotcha. Question. And then, um, Dr. Rogers, if you would just... Uh, I think I had emailed you a question that a, a concern that a constituent had, had about um, the uh, what what was it the pers the the, pers the personally identifiable information. Well, not that, and as well as um, actually, I'm going to probably circle around because I want to find that specific question. Okay. okay, thank you. So I'll I'll come back later. All right, Mrs. Hughes. So, one of my questions is. Uh, Ms. Bell had commented about some particular things that nobody uses. Um, if no one uses them, then why are they still included? They're designed to be examples. Yep, 
they're designed to be examples. Um, one of the pieces of those that a lot of our districts do use are the assessments, the performance-based assessments. Um, but with the realistically, what I meant when I said no one uses them is I meant that no one uses them exactly as written or as shown in the program. All of our districts do personalize those and pull out the pieces that best complement their curriculum maps and their instructional goals. So they're really designed to be exemplars, but different places around the country use different pieces in different times. Well, I have multiple problems with the content in here. I mean, there is a lot of highly sexual content. And I'm sorry, I think sixth graders are little kids. Um, <laughs> actually, I have a 22-year-old that seems like a little kid to me. But certainly, if they haven't reached the age of majority, they're little kids. And I don't understand why adults who are entrusted to care for children want to inject this into their education. Can someone explain that to me? Uh, go ahead. Can you share? more specifics in terms of a specific story or um, the references to oral sex in there so is there a particular can you share the, the article so we can pull it up and address that one <clears throat> okay actually miss Manning has it in front of her so I'll just let her ask that when she gets there if, if you have, go it. Ahead, have it somewhere. okay um, I, I have seen things in here though that seem biased they seem highly sexual and it is it is a problem. Actually, I, I went to the same thing on trafficking that one of our speakers was talking about earlier, and they talk about the grooming. We do not need to be sexualizing our children. It used to be that we told children, go to your teacher, go to your principal, and now we don't know if it's a teacher who considers this appropriate for children. You know, who protects the children? And these, in these surveys, um, I find it very difficult to believe that you put something online that collects information to say we're not collecting information. I don't know why anybody would think it would be appropriate to ask children how many guns they have in their home. It's none of your business. Um, and to ask children whether or not their parents monitor their cell phones. You know, as, as a child, I was told you never tell people when your parents are not home. Well, now the internet and all of this technology has invaded our homes. Everything comes into your home through your computer, through your cell phone, through social media. And now we need to know which kids monitor and which ones don't. It is a great way to find out which children are vulnerable. And this should not be happening. We also have parents who really like to check out what their children are learning. And one of the things that is being promoted here is that this is very easily editable. So I could go in and look and see what I think my child's learning, and tomorrow it could be completely different. And people could slip things in that I, I don't appreciate. You know, you talk about people prefer read aloud. Of course they do. It's easier than reading a book, except we have issues with literacy. Now, it did make sense that if you're learning a second language, hearing and reading it together would help you. But children need to be learning how to read, and literacy is down. And the thing... <laughs> All of this together is that you stood up here and said, teachers and districts hold all of the power. No, ma'am. Parents should hold all of the power. Parents should be able to monitor everything that their children are being taught. It is highly problematic when government schools have all the power and parents don't. I, I just, I cannot support this. There are just so many problems with it. Mrs. Manning. <clears throat> okay, so I do agree. This is very user friendly. I was able to navigate it very well, very easily. I went through all the curriculum units. I went through all the resources that were provided in the curriculum units and went through all of it. So it was very easy to navigate. Um, my first question is, will every student have the ability to use the read aloud function? That is controllable by the teacher. So in the places where you're legally obligated to meet the student's um, ILP or IEP according to whether or not the student needs additional support, you do have that option. If you have students that don't need that option, that is something that can be turned off for students. So teachers would have to be responsible for making sure that button is turned off? Teachers are responsible for making sure they're meeting their IEP and ILPs as well. So it's very similar to the same way you would make accommodations in the classroom. Okay, because I'm very concerned about that option, and 
I know, I know kids who are math and science kids who don't want to read, and they're going to push that button to listen. It can be turned off. And it can be. Yes. But again, that's another, another thing that it, that's going to be on the teacher's plate. It can be tapped to have to the entire sure. class once at the beginning of the school year for those students, and then they will never have to touch that button again. It will okay. not appear for those students. Okay. So I believe, Dr. Rogers, you said the context of the textbook um, that was previewed by the public isn't necessarily what the students will be using, is basically what I was told, right? Yes, That's, Is that correct? That's okay. correct. So we have on our agenda that we're approving an online textbook for English curriculum. Textbook adoption, secondary English textbooks. State law requires that we put out our textbooks, including electronic textbooks, for the public to review so that they know what's in them, so that they know what their kids are going to be learning. So what we put out to the public, what I looked at as a parent, I'm looking at this saying, OK, this is the curriculum unit. This is what they're going to be learning. This is what this is the books that go with it, because that's what was put out to the public. That's the password they were given. This is what what we're going to be adopting is what we're going to be voting on. But basically what I've heard here tonight is everything that we've reviewed here and everything that the public has reviewed isn't really what the kids are going to be learning. It could be one of 24,000, I don't remember how many resources. It would be one of 24,000 pieces of information. And I, you know, perhaps this is a question for Ms. Linetti, but I don't know how that, that, that meets the intent of the law. The intent of the law is so that parents can look at these textbooks and know what's in them, and the public can know what's in them to give feedback. Our public came in and gave feedback. And a lot of people are here saying, oh, that's not what's in it. That is what's in it. What every single person, what Dr. Duke, professor from MIT, stood there and read about Angela Davis. Angela Davis didn't write that article. It was an interview with Angela Davis. And here's what she said. How do we reimagine community? How do we reimagine family? How do we reimagine sexual identity? How do we reimagine everything in the light of a change that is so far reaching and that it is our responsibility to make? We can't expect to make it. We can't expect them to make it. We have to reimagine it ourselves. We have to think beyond capitalist categories. That is, that was an article that was provided in one of the units that our public reviewed. Um, the one um, that you asked about um, on sexualization, sixth grade. All the kids aren't doing it. Um, students were asked how often they thought each social group would get involved in such activities as using marijuana, having sexual intercourse, having oral sex. How's the teacher going to explain that one? Miss teacher, sixth grader, maybe hasn't had that conversation yet. What's oral sex? That's in here. That was one of the resources, sixth grade, unit eight. I also have concerns, like Miss Miss Hughes said, that these are the curriculum units, but these aren't the curriculum units. <laughs> So I'm just very confused. Ms. Linetti, can you address my question regarding we're putting this textbook out for the public to review so that they know what their, their, their child's going to be learning, but now I'm told that none of this is really what their child's going to be learning, perhaps. I do think with any textbook you're, you're going to be picking and choosing out of it, so they are going to have to develop for you and tell you what you're going to be using out. This is the potential body of information, but correct. I don't know what exactly each grade is going to be used in which curriculum. So I think you're going to have to have a curriculum out there that's going to be have to be seen by the parents to have an opportunity to look at it. Some of the questions that you're asking are covered under different types of laws that deal with surveys and questions about that, with family life issues, so there are notices and things that have to be put out to the parent prior to beginning the school year or a certain amount of time ahead of time when you're doing this, so those laws will also have to be complied with and that notice will have to be out there. So they're going to have to develop the curriculum, show that to the parents, the notices will have to be out at a certain time period, and the parents will have the opportunity to opt their students out of it. So as certain categories, such as sexual content and other things, those do have the notice requirements. Other things may not necessarily fall under those categories, but eventually they're going to have to show you the categories and the curriculum that the parents can look at. Okay, so if um, this poll remains in there, this is one of the polls, um, which the following best describes your household. There are no guns in my home. There's at least one gun in my home. It's locked away. There's at least one gun in my home. It's not locked away. If this or say something about sexualization or another divisive topic that falls under the PPRA, 
um, is not is given to a child and the parents not made no, not notified of that or the parent has opted them out of it we could be set up for liability issues PPRA is one of the laws that applies. PPRA, the federal law on it, and PPRA has set categories that fall into the guns are not going to probably fall into that. Sexual issues, family issues, mental health issues, drug use would fall into those categories. But PPRA has is broken into two different categories. So it has to do with funding, who's funding them, and depending on who funds it, that determines the type of notice you have to give. So we would have to look at each one of those questions. In addition to that, Virginia has a state law, has several state laws on this, but one of them in particular is 22.179.3. It's, it's has more rules than the PPRA does, mm -hmm. So that, but it also it's not going to cover as many categories on it. So you're going to have to go through that. That is also going to have to give an out. You're also going to have to explain how the information is used. Parents have the opportunity to look at it. They will have to have the opportunity to opt their children out of it. There are a lot of burdens with using surveys and questions like that. So depending on what you choose to use in these curriculums, the um, school division is going to have to go through and pick out that and make sure that the notices are out there for them. So I can't tell you what they're going That's to use, whether they're going to turn off any of the surveys, but that will... If those are continued to use questions like that, just as you would have, it doesn't have to be an online. If a teacher did these questions in the class, then the same rules would apply. This, they have to follow those curriculum rules. Right, but these are kind of already in there unless we turn them off, which I haven't been told that we are. So um, the next concern that I have is, is a little bit related on that. It's re regarding the privacy concerns, and this is straight from the online textbook website that I looked at here. Information we collect from teachers or administrators account information. If you have an account which your school district, school or district may have created on your behalf, we may collect your name, email address, a password, your school, district, classes you teach, and the names, grade, email addresses, and identifiers of the students in your classes. And that goes on to say under information we collect from students, we may collect the student's name, ID number, a password, um, test scores, teacher feedback, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera things that will be collected. I don't know exactly where that data is going to be stored, but that is going to be collected by Actively Learn. Uh, they will have access to that. So I have concerns about that. I know that perhaps through a contract we might be able to get around it, but just because we can get around it, I don't think that that's the right thing to do. Um, all that data, all that private data is going to be out there. So if I may offer a little bit of... And Mr. Den and Ms. Bell may be able to assist in, in that effort. <clears throat> the data that are shared that I believe that they are speaking of is data relative to uh, communicating with grade pass back and single sign on. And the information that they have that they collect is only information that we provide to them. So, Mr. Den, we have other similar resources where we communicate with so that they'll have uh, information in order to roster our students. Um, so that would be the information that we're speaking of. We work very closely with the Department of Technology uh, to ensure that uh, COPA and FERPA guidelines are followed and that only information that we provide them is information that is collected. For the purposes of, we also have a resource called Catch On. We talked about that a couple of years ago that provides the district information relative to how often our students are using the digital resources, not just in this instance if we weren't able to adopt it, but we have you know, Redbird, we have um, uh, No Red Ink, we have lots of digital resources with which we collect information from, and we have to be able to communicate with those companies in order to be able to translate those data into the resources that we use to make instructional decisions. So um, the assurance that I got most recently was such that the company does not collect information and certainly does not transfer that information to third parties. So Dr. Mr. Den, did you want to add anything to that relative to collecting information? Okay. okay. I, you know, I'm glad to hear that. But that still sure. doesn't ease my mind that, I mean, it's still data that a third party company is going to have. Um, and just my last, and then I'll let somebody else go, screen time. Um, we're going from hard textbooks to online, and I understand I, that's kind of the future. But we're going to online everything. We're going to online. They have access to all of their online textbooks. They're, they're textbooks that, I mean, we had one speaker tonight say that, you know, her child is on the screens 80% of the time in, in, in their schoolwork. 
Um, and now this is going to just increase that screen time. And, and that is a major concern of mine. Thank you. So, Mrs. Manning, you get no argument here. And that's something that we constantly have conversations about. What's the balance, especially coming out of, of a pandemic and is an endemic, is making sure that we provide resources and training for our teachers to be able to leverage both the digital resources and the print resources. So, you know, that's not going away. It's a matter of, of training and making sure that we work very closely with our building based leaders to continue to have those conversations. So, you know, as a professional educator, you get no argument from me relative to being able to leverage both the digital and the print resources. I love the way books smell. I like the feel of them. Uh, and I certainly want our students to have that same level of love. And I don't think any digital resource can replace that. So, um, I agree with you there. And it's something that we continue to work on. Mrs. Holtz, were you still on the queue? You still want to be in the queue, Mrs. Holtz? Me? Yes. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. I really appreciated it. Um, I, I think it's such a wonderful resource for teachers to use in their lesson planning, and it allows some creativity for teachers because uh, sometimes having to stick with this S, with the SOLs one, two, three, four, five, the way we knew raise them. It doesn't always allow for that, but there's over, I read there were over 50,000 texts involved in this. And teachers can pick and choose the ones to expect a teacher to uh, publish somehow every single word of their lesson plan, you know, every, every day of the year is totally impossible. It just ruins creativity. And there does have to be some trust involved in, you know, the teachers that we, um, the teachers that we train and the teachers that we also hire. So, um, but I, I do know that there are thousands of parents who do trust teachers' judgment and who do appreciate the work they're doing. So I fully support the approval of this current recommendation for the English online textbooks because these books expose students to relevant contemporary issues and they generate timely discussions. Um, <coughs> It, I found it better. Thank you. I need background music. <laughs> Play the violin. But anyhow, I'm, I'm really surprised that all of a sudden, three people and a, a board member mentioned Angela Davis tonight. I lived in the time frame of Angela Davis. Um, I know her activism well. I was a young adult at the same time that she was. Uh, in New York, in Chicago, and everywhere. Um, and if you want to be negative about this program, I'll bring up her name. But um, so her name didn't come up spontaneously here tonight. She was targeted. And I, I object to that. And I, I'm really sorry about that. But she's part of our history. So uh, yes, I think there could be a very lively discussion among young people today about what happened and whether you approve or disapprove. You know, it's, it's part of our history. That's the point I'm trying to make here. So we don't want to squash that. But um, I also, I was a very, I felt very good about the teachers' comments when they talked about what they liked. And some of them said what they disliked, but that was very minimal. Uh, that how they appreciated that and how it would help them to do a better job in their lesson. And um, I think um, people, people who would disallow these texts they're stifling discussions and conversations. They are not acting in the best interests of our diverse population. And that is what we have today. We're not contained here in Virginia Beach nor in the United States. We are a global population. Diversity is, is what we are all about. So I love these texts. And I, every teacher I've talked to has approved of them. And I thank you for bringing them to us tonight in such a respectful way and explaining some of the problems. Thank you. Of course. All right. So we this is not our first digital choice. We are or we have what can you share what other digital resources dis, we have? We, well, I mean we don't we have a science digital there textbook science digital now? Textbooks that's so some of these same, so some of these concerns and issues clearly are not unique to the English side of the things are they? Uh, probably not, and more so um, 
I, the similarities I would think would be having teacher choice and option, being able to provide structured resources and activities that are designed within the context of the resource itself, as well as potentially um, the sharing of personally identifiable information from students and collecting information and grade pass back and uh, sharing of, of data that way. So those are the similarities I would see. Um, I would also um, potentially say the amount of screen time um, would be a, a point of concern or consideration as we would with any other digital resource. Um, but not, not to the extent of what we've had conversation here. But my point being the broader, there are parallel, there are, there are cross connections with other digital disciplines. And, and this isn't our first foray into the digital no, world. I not wanna just make that clear. Uh, the screen time, I see this as, because certainly I, I don't think there's anybody up here who wouldn't have the concern, but for me it's a, it's a matter of, it's been reiterated time and again that this, this creates more engagement. So just because you have your laptop opened up doesn't mean you're not, that I would hope there's there's face-to-face -face engagement and discussion as you're looking at a screen, as you're referring to your screen. So that's different from just an hour of reading a screen. So I hope, I mean, to me, that's where that balance would be Correct. happening or would be my hope. Correct. Uh, so let me see, there was just one other thing. Uh, so my, my two children are 30-somethings now, so they were English students back in the early and mid-2000s, and I think back to that, and I mean, as a parent, and I considered myself a pretty hands-on parent, but I think the nature of the discipline of English instruction is such that teachers have always been pulling resources from other sources. And I mean, you you were, you confirmed that most recently with whatever it was that we that the license just expired, and before that, the teachers have been pulling multiple resources. And I I certainly never was privy to every single piece of whether it was a speech or a poem that my child read. I, I probably was aware of the novels they were reading because they would bring those home. Right. So I think there is something unique about the the teaching of English because it is much broader in that respect. So while I, I agree that there's an element of trust that's needed, I also feel that we've heard concerns tonight that hopefully some have have been already addressed, that others will be considered as you as you meet with it with these PLCs. And in you know, and I think age appropriateness is a is a legitimate concern and I would hope especially for middle school that that message is at least considered. Yeah. Well, and I agree I like to use the term bounded autonomy Mrs. Rye relative to the creative freedom that our teachers have. Uh, we have a curriculum we have standards of learning with which we must follow as set forth by the state of Virginia and then we also work very collaboratively with our district level staff as well as our building level staff and decisions are generally not made in isolation. So in other words, when you go into one seventh grade classroom, English classroom, at a middle school level you have four, potentially five English teachers and generally what you can see is, I like to refer to as apples and applesauce from one classroom to, to another and you generally don't see teachers going off and teaching things in isolation. Um, one of the benefits that, that, that I like about any level of resource uh, of this kind at the district level, especially with having um, an opportunity produce, to produce uh, valid autonomy with text, is that you lessen the opportunities that staff have for going out on their own and Googling resources that may or may not be aligned to Virginia standards or using teachers pay teachers and actually paying for resources that are cool but are not necessarily aligned, or even Pinterest uh, activities that are great, but are not necessarily aligned. So we want to have some level of control at the district level uh, that we can say that these activities and resources are absolutely aligned. And you saw Mrs. Bell pull it up where you can uh, do things by standard. Uh, and we can stand by and have conversations with families if they have questions or concerns about the resources that are there. Um, and making sure that they are age appropriate. We certainly don't want our students uh, having access to materials that aren't age appropriate or that aren't aligned or um, in conjunction with what uh, the standards are that we teach or our curriculum for that matter. Okay, Mrs. Anderson and Mrs. Hughes. 
So th that actually is a seg segment that, that goes along with the questions that I had to ask. And so let's be clear, this is an online resource, yes, correct? That is more aligned with our curriculum. Maybe that's why Chesapeake and Chesterfield chose to do this as well. Do teachers and students currently use Google as a resource currently? As a main source of? Well, as a resource. Well, I'm sure teachers use Google. I mean, right. And uh, do we have control over that? Have, have parents yes. given permission and, and looked at all the things that are available on Google? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think it's possible to find all the things on Google at this point. So what my point is, would this English resource eliminate the reason that teachers would have to choose to use Google? Or what was the other one you said, teachers? Teachers pay teachers is teachers quite popular pay teachers, with our, Yeah, our I, I, those are, those are some ones that teachers use quite often. Um, we don't have control over those. Parents don't have control over any of that. But this is more aligned, this particular resource that we're looking at tonight is more aligned with our particular curriculum, with our SOLs, with our v Virginia Beach objectives, with, our, with the curriculum that Virginia Beach wants. That's why this is a better resource than just allowing teachers to go out on their own. This is much better and more, uh, more aligned with what we, what we want our students to know. Um, so I just, you know, I, I can't see that we should, we can find negatives in every single thing out there. And like, you know, I can find negatives on Google at this point. Um, anybody can. And that's what can, can happen is we don't really have control at this point, but this gives our teachers more control. So um, I'm in favor of this. Thank you. Mrs. Hughes and then Mrs. Weems. Well, the ridiculous high, ridiculously high percentage of screen time is a genuine concern. Moving to more and more screen time is just not okay. Um, I'd also like to point out, you know, we're talking about transparency here and letting the public review that. Actually, the only reason that happened is because it got pulled off the agenda when Ms. Manning pointed out that you were supposed to do that. And I can't help but think that the reason you didn't just do it on your own is because you didn't want these discussions because when the public started reading this stuff, they were not happy. And we have this resource that has a lot of what most people would consider pretty inappropriate material put together by a company and we're supposed to be able to trust that, but it'll be brought in here and we're supposed to trust people to edit it down even though you thought it was okay to use a resource that has all of that stuff that you have to edit down and it'll be edited down by the same people who think it's okay to have books in our school libraries that depict oral sex. So I'm not sure where that level of trust is. And we're also hearing from teachers who are leaving because they're not happy with some of the stuff that's being taught. So we'll have more that leave and the ones that don't leave maybe don't have a problem with this, but the parents do. Um, the, the level of transparency was only because you were shamed into it. And after seeing some of the stuff I've seen in here, I guess my next question would be, can parents opt out of this text if y'all decide to use this? So respectfully, we had about 60, some, it was about half, we got about half. We extended the time period of review by a month. So prior to our extension, we had about 65, 67. about, I'm sorry. 67. So we had 67 responses before we were asked to put it out again. So we probably doubled the amount. So it was about half uh, relative to because the notice was so out, buried that people didn't <clears throat> notice it relative to parents being able to uh, opt out. We do have a policy that uh, parents we certainly honor well relative to their not wanting to have their children participate in any uh, resource. And we have a process that we you know we certainly will absolutely honor uh, should the need arise. Well, I would recommend that if this board, and it's looking like it's going this way, approves this, that every parent opt out of using this text with your child. Excuse me, Madam Chair, can you add Ms. Owens to the queue? All right. Yes, Mrs. Weems. Thank you. So 
I'm a little confused. So this is not our curriculum. So what is our curriculum, English curriculum? From, is it just the SOLs? And this is, so, we, so our curriculum in Virginia Beach for English is the standards of learning. Yes, ma'am. And this is just one resource. This is one resource. Yes, we okay. have several. Um, so yeah, I just want to say, I, I want to thank the parents that did come out and, and speak for or against it. I, I'm sensing that, that some of my colleagues up here are almost getting frustrated with the parents um, and saying, you know, well, I wasn't privy to all the information. And back in the day, you know, I didn't know what my you know, kids were reading. And that's fine. Some parents don't want to be involved. And, and some parents are too busy to be involved. Other parents want to be involved. You know, we have helicopter par parents. We have Velcro, Vel Velcro parents is what sometimes I call them. And we have, you know, parents in a big airplane way far away. So, but I, I don't think just because we didn't get involved or that we didn't know our kids' curriculum doesn't, we shouldn't be negative about parents coming and, and, and learning and trying to get all the information they can because I think that's great. And so I just want to get that out there. Um, I, I, I'm not going to reiterate um, some concerns that have already been spoken because I do think some of the examples that have been given are not age appropriate when we're talking about, I mean, middle school is 10 and 11 year olds. Most, most of them are 11 years old all through the first year. Some are 10. Um, so I'm not sure why some of this stuff is even in an English class, especially for, an 11, for a 10 and 11 year old. So, and then when we say, well, don't worry about it because it can be taken out, that just, that, that doesn't make sense to me. Um, let, uh, with the read aloud, so are you saying, Dr. Rogers, that we're going to make sure that the only people that get the read aloud are those that have it in their IEP? So that is not what I've shared. I or, think or, Mrs. Okay, Bell okay, shared okay, that we have the capability of turning it off for all students uh, at the beginning of the year such that teachers won't have to uh, continually turn it on and off. But what, what I've heard shared, and I didn't know that until today, is that uh, should a student have the need for the accommodation that they would be able to turn the uh, read aloud on okay, for those I think, students? I think that needs to be really, really thoroughly um, talked about because you're going to have some students that don't have it on their IEP but prefer to, to learn, you know, through their ears and prefer to listen to something instead of read, and that's fine because some of us are more visual learners or some are auditory. Sure. But if it's not in their IEP and they prefer... I'm concerned about them saying, well, you know, that's the way I learn best. You don't have an IEP. Well, that's the way I learn best. That's, where, that's the way I want to learn. And so then they do all this. And then what are we going to do with the SOLs? Because in order to have that accommodation on the SOLs, you have to have it in your IEP. So I hope that we're not going to get these kids to listen to something, you know, read alouds all year. And then on their SOLs, oh, you can't do read aloud because that's, you know, I just think that's problematic. So I hope sure. that we really, really discuss that and have a consistent answer so that the teacher is just not saying, I oh, know in my class, only two people get the read aloud, but then the teacher in the next hallway, well, you can get the read, read aloud anytime you want to. So I think that's going to be problematic. So I hope that we really, um, you know, talk about that. Um, how much how much time do you think our kids are in front of a screen during school? I don't. Sixth through twelfth grade. Just an estimate. Yeah. You've been in the schools. You're probably in the schools a lot. Yeah. Well, fifty percent. It depends on the teacher, and it also depends on the content area. Okay, so fifty percent um, yeah. of their class instruction time. So that's about what three 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 and a half hours. A day on average. Okay. So I I have a huge issue about going completely digital, and that's that's what it looks like we're doing because we've got the digital si science we've got this i would assume our next textbook adoption is going to be digital i you know for two years we've sat up here listen to the science listen to the doctors listen to the science listen to the doctors listen to the doctors american association of pediatrics one to two hours daily max of screen time and we already have it three hours this is just going to add more I think in some cases, like the parent that shared today, I think it's 80 or 90 percent of the time. I'm very concerned with that. We're buying, you know, glasses for our kids because they're staring at the screen. And so, I mean, I know, and I, and I understand it. I'm not, 
you know, and I'm, I'm not coming in the digital age kicking and screaming because I think we do have to have it, but there's got to be a balance. And I guess my question is, are we heading down that road where every text is going to be digital? Um, you know, I, and I actually called my daughter yesterday who's getting her master's, so she, it's only been two years since she's been out of, you know, regular college. And I said, did you have, like, textbooks or digital? And she goes, no, in undergrad, all four years, she had a physical textbook. <laughs> and she said, now she's got digital because it was optional and it was cheaper for her personally. So that's why she chose it. But she, you know, but she likes the textbook too and, and different people like it. But, it. but in college, she said, I think 90%, 90, almost every class for four years was a textbook in hand. So I know that, you know, that some colleges haven't gone altogether digital. I know private schools around here haven't gone all digital. Um, some of them are actually getting rid of digital every day because they see that the students um, need the, the hand paper, the, the writing. And so that's a, that's a huge concern because even all the books are digital. And, you know, the great Gatsby that you showed, I'm sure that you're going to read it. We still have print uh, and trade books, and that certainly will not change. Uh, okay. with, uh, with uh, it's just a huge concern because I know that, you know, the pandemic, the pandemic brought, you know, an opportunity, obviously, to to take advantage of our one to one um, technology. But I'm seeing it even at the elementary levels that we haven't sprung back. You know, we're still doing, you know, digital and music classes. We're still on the screen for so much. And I just so I mean, you know, but again, that's just my personal opinion. I think that we've there's I do not think there's a balance. And and I feel that this is another way to to increase that level of screen time. Sure. Mrs. Williams, and, you know, as I shared with Mrs. Manning, you know, that is something that we yeah. will continue to certainly work with our, our, our staff with, not just in English, but in all of our content areas and at all levels relative to maintaining that balance of screen time and uh, interaction with their peers as well as with print text. Well, I appreciate that. Thank certainly. You. Okay, Ms. <clears throat> Mrs. Franklin. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. Um, I did actually find the question. So about the data collection in terms of um, the uh, the privacy rating um, for this, did we ever find a response for that? Yes, we did, Mrs. Bell. Yes, that privacy concern was from January of 2020. Our privacy policies have been updated twice since then to okay. match our parent company, which has a 96% rating on that. Okay, well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And I, I just want to make a few comments here. Um, first of all, no matter how this discussion came about, I'm thankful that we have the transparency. I think that it's really important that we have the feedback from, um, you know, from parents and constituents. And I, I you know, I, I love listening. And quite honestly, um, I don't want this to be a politically charged position. I want this to be a factually charged position or decision for me. And, um, and I think that, you know, our wonderful moral warriors that are out there, I, I do believe that between them and the oversight that the division will provide, um, you know, will uh, provide a basis. And I think all the feedback we've gotten so far will provide a great basis should this move forward, correct, uh, in terms of what we feel like the constituents will want and align with. And also we have the opt-out option, right? Um, and I just, I just want to make a comment because I know that, uh, you know, it has been kind of um, inferred that if you vote for this that you're a Marxist or you're pro-socialism. I've served also in the military for plus 20 years. And I definitely am not a Marxist or a socialist supporter. Um, and I do believe America is a great country. And I also believe that BBCS is, uh, Z CPS is a great school division. Um, and the, we do a lot of great things. I went to the, the GRC gala on, on um, gala on Saturday night. We are doing amazing things in this division. Um, and you know, I just want to make sure that we understand that this is a resource, just like a gun, uh, can't hurt somebody unless the person, uh, we've, we, you know, during the debate, when we're, can we bring weapons into the building? You know, I just think back and, you know, we talked about how guns are, are not a danger in, in themselves, it's just how we utilize them. And I think that that is a great argument in this situation as well as, you know, this looks and appears like it's a great resource, but, you know, we want to make sure that it's used for things that are positive um, and that we're using it as a, a resource that is going to um, provide 
you know, great options for teachers and students, but also, you know, allow um, opportunities for, for parents and families to also um, have, you know, input and weigh in as well. Um, the one thing I feel like that is weighing on my decision right now, though, um, is the fact that we have Chesapeake and Chesterfield counties um, that are successfully using this resource. Um, and I've actually put it out there to a parent who has reached out to some friends in those divisions, and they haven't heard of any issues so far. Um, both of them are conservative divisions. Um, and, uh, and I feel like, you know, we just talked about Chesterfield, um, you know, how they're doing a great job with bus drivers and doing those types of things and making the, uh, the decisions that are really helping their division. Um, so I feel like while we are looking at this, we also have to um, give an opportunity because it does appear as if, you know, kids are going to have um, a digital resource um, in the future. And so I think that we have to give an opportunity to continue to weigh in and provide resources um, and oversight and input um, while also entrusting the teacher to be able to um, make some decisions in their classrooms and us as a division as well. So um, I feel like if it's being successfully implemented and has been successfully impl implemented in Chesapeake and Chesterfield, I feel like we as a division should also be able to do that as well. So, thank you. Ms. Owens, you're on. Okay, and I will keep it brief. Um, actually, I just wanted to uh, thank the uh, administrators and those who are on uh, the team and reviewing the book. I am happy to see a book that is inclusive in so many ways. We heard just last month from so many of the people in our community who speak English as a second language about their needs, their resources, they want to be included and to feel included. And we have an opportunity to bring a book that well, we know we don't have the ESL staff available to assist in the manner that we would love them to be able to, and to be able to bring a book that can help with that. To be able to bring a book that I, as a parent of a child who had an IEP from second grade through graduation, it's one thing when your child can receive IEP services at school during school hours, but when they come home, you don't always have time to then serve as an IEP coordinator at home. Some parents I'm sure do. Some of us don't all the time. And to have a book that can allow for them get their read aloud resources or whatever other resources uh, they would likely be able to get in the classroom at home to do their homework is encouraging to me. But to have a resource that children who bounce between two and three homes on a regular basis or may have to leave their home quickly for whatever reason can still go and access their book. I'm pleased with the options. I know that there will always be something negative to say. And if you get a resource that has over 24,000 articles, I'm sure we can find one or two that we can argue about for any electronic resource. But I'm, I'm pleased that uh, the work was done and this is what we came up with. So I wanted to share that and I'm ready for us to vote when the comments are completed. <clears throat> I feel uh, I should clarify uh, the communication with respect to textbook review that it, this started out with the same process or protocol that was used in the division for years. Uh, and so when it came to light that, you know, this there might be a better way, uh, Miss Allen and her team put it out in a in a monthly update notice to, and so I, so now we have a better practice moving forward. But I, I think it needs to be said that the initial outreach was just consistent with the past practice, and we're always looking to do better in that regard. And so we did in this case. Um, all right. So Mrs. Felton, thank you, Chair Ron. Appreciate this moment. And, and uh, Dr. Rogers, thank you for that thorough uh, presentation. I do appreciate it. And some of the things that you hit in this presentation really hit home for me. I know when I was at ODU, 
in my uh, getting my degree at ODU, uh, a textbook cost me two hundred dollars. And when I wanted to get a refund back from that two hundred some dollar book, I only got that ninety eight dollars back from that. It was stifling. Uh, then uh, digital started coming online at ODU when I was there in two thousand seven and taking my classes, and it was a it was a brief. Believe it or not, a lot of the professors they had a detest about us having to pay that much for books. And, and one professor, the only reason I make you buy the book is because they tell me I have to make you buy the book, go get the book. Other than that, I wouldn't do it. I would teach you from my class, from my curriculum, because that's all I'm doing anyway. But I just have to say, you have been hit with a lot of hard um, questions and suggestions. And I just like to know, um, and maybe you've already spoken under, I just like to know that you're going to uh, place this, and if we do decide to vote for it. This will be placed in um, in the professional and capable hands of teachers that has gone to school for seven years, several years, and in between that, while they're in teaching as teachers, every two or three years, sometimes they're recertified to make sure that they're proficient at what they are doing as teachers. So you're gonna place this, this opportunity into certified hands to teach it to instruct our students. As a matter of fact, I'm finding out now that we have a lot of parents in our schools that are teachers. I'm finding out they really hold dearly to the Virginia Beach City Public Schools Division as they teach as well. Yes, we might be having a lot of them leaving, but it's because of compensation. And we hope that by the time we do this study that a lot of them will come back and be teachers here. And we do want them to have a, a, um, a living wage that's problematic all over the nation. But my question to you, to you as well: How will this, how will this be implemented? How will the teachers get their training to implement this within the schools if this is voted on tonight? So, we have lots of training planned on paper. Of course, we're not being presumptuous relative to what the outcome is uh, this evening. So, I'm going to ask. Cammie Batterson Jacob to come and talk about just what you've asked. Hi there, thank you for having us tonight. Um, I, I, during the summer, we will work with a vendor to have uh, specialists come out to train our teachers. We also hope to work with a vendor to design that district library that you heard so much about and um, to curate and create, and then we will bring that to teachers for them to look through it and vet it. And so that's another layer of professional development when they're looking through the program and helping to decide what pieces of text go in to that particular grade level and or that particular unit of study that the students um, need to do throughout the year and it will also be aligned to those focus standards that are in each unit so through the practice of vetting the material for the district as well as um, training that will offer the teachers um, so that is the plan not to be presumptuous but kind of in the back of our minds when we think about how we would roll this out to teachers we also have literacy leaders that we will train and we kind of like to do the train the trainer model where they will be the ones that also help assist the PLCs when they're working with the teachers and in, in the, during the regular classroom day and week and months to come Thank you, and uh, just one more, I'd just like to say too that um, when I was at ODU, at a research library, library working there, and as a student, um, sometimes I would have subjects that I had to research, so in order to, I would use Google to, to research a, a topic, but before I would use that topic, I would, I would have to place it back into a scholarly um, magazine to make sure that it was cited and that it was correct to use because everything at that time on Google was not uh, proficient or even correct to use. So I would have to take out that subject, cut and paste it into a scholarly uh, academic book. So and when Papa said, I said, yeah, I can use this. So it is refreshing and you hit it on the district library, which can be customized it, it, where you can go in. And this looked like uh, it appears to be something that I longed for when I was at ODU, that you go to one place that, w that was certified that was durable, that was substantial, that I could say this is it and it's good, I can use it. So it, this appeared to be exactly, this resource appeared to be exactly what I would have wanted to have, have when I was at ODU. Thank you so much. Of course. All right, I believe discussion has concluded. 
So I'm going to now call for a vote with, among my colleagues. So all in favor of the textbook adoption, secondary English, show a raised hand, please. Ms. Owens, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Vice Chair Melnick, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have eight ayes. Okay. All opposed, kindly show a raised hand. Madam Chair, we have three nays, so the motion did pass, eight to three. All right. Thank you, Madam Clerk. That leaves us with our return with our committee organization or board reports. So who would like to begin? Mrs. Riggs. Um, I just want to remind everybody that I do have the tickets or will have the tickets for the um, uh, Sister City Youth Ambassador uh, Gala, which is an, an art contest, which is going to be on April 22nd at the Zyder Theater. It starts at 630. It's $25 a ticket for adults, $10 for students, and um, under the age of six is free. It's going to be really good. I think um, people will like it, so please see me if you like it or just give me an email and I'll make sure you get your tickets. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, who's next? GRC. Um, well, again, I uh, many of us actually attended the GRC gala, and it was probably one of the the best events that I've ever done since I've been in the seat. And uh, just the stories, the the amazing, inspiring students that came up and spoke, um, just made the night the night just completely amazing. Um, and we were able to raise not quite the goal, so. Please, we please contribute to uh, GRC Foundation, um, but we were not quite able to raise the goal completely, but um, we did raise a lot of money that night, and I just thank all of the supporters and all the people that continue to assist with that program. It's amazing. Thank you. Mrs. Felton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just had to say that I um, had a meeting with the uh, General Advisory Council for the Techn Technical and Career Education on Wednesday, it was um, very fruitful, very uh, resourceful uh, in getting the information from Mrs. Lockett and all the advisors that was there. But the most important thing that took place, that we had a tour uh, at Lansdowne High School with the students, and they were phenomenal. They were putting together a carnival that would be, that would um, extensively talk about microcontrollers and gathering various types of data. And it, they were dealing with the sensitivities of how sensors can be picked up. And one of the things that they were using, they were using a, a dunk, a water dunk, to dunk people in to just to measure the uh, sensitivity of that. And also a dot ball throw as well. Uh, I think it was very innovative of them because they were putting together a makeshift um, tent they couldn't be outside, and they were doing everything by hand, and these were all of our students, and that was coordinated by Mr. Lee, and uh, Mr. Swartz uh, also had another component, dealing with the student with Adobe Lightroom and inter introducing the students to how to work with uh, Adobe programs, uh, supporting communications and STEM marketing. The students are great. They were phenomenal, and they also had a podcast on the side. And I was interviewed by the students. We talked quite a bit about their curriculum and what they wanted to go out to be. Uh, one young man said he wanted to be a nurse, and another one said he wanted to be a, um, a um, journalist. And they really went into what they wanted to be. It is so refreshing when you can go out to the academies and get a chance and just talk with the students and see them interacting with what they're getting from these uh, academies. And I would just uh, would encourage all of my uh, school board colleagues to, when they have these uh, technical career education programs, to get out and see them and talk with them. It will blow you away. And again, it's just a, a great opportunity to be a part of this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Another Mrs. 
Franklin? Yes. I also just wanted to give a shout out to the Kellum High School Musical Theater Department. Um, I actually went on Sunday to the SpongeBob Musical, and I was pretty excited to go and even more impressed after I was there. The production was just outstanding. Um, it's everything that I've ever heard about Kellum Productions, and so great job to Mr. Copen and his team. So thanks. Here, here to that. Uh, they did another amazing job this year. That, I, that I've been every year that I've been on the board, and I'll tell you what, it, they never, never cease to amaze me. Anything else? Well, fairness and advertising. Okay, Mrs. Briggs. I just want to give a shout out for the Pearls of Wisdom uh, <laughs> because it was, uh, again, a very great uh, opportunity to raise money for um, um, the. Virginia Beach Education Foundation, and uh, there were lots of people there. It was always great food and great um, uh, entertainment, as well as uh, raising money. I don't know how much they raised, but um, they did a good job as always. So it was it was great to be there. Yes, thank you. I, uh, in my ex officio role, I was I was there at the uh, ticket or with the wristbands for a while, uh, but. That, that's months and months of work, and, and I, they were blessed with nice weather, or I should say we were. Uh, so let's see. I, I, in fairness, I want to add that Princess Anne had its musical also, and uh, that was Shrek. And I'll just say that even though this technically should have been admin matters and not now, but the high school theater public is the best deal in town, and there's still plenty of performances left, and uh, the... There is an arts calendar on the website I, I, that uh, people can refer to for those opportunities. And in my other governance note, a uh, uh, quick governance note committee meets tomorrow at one o'clock. And I think that uh, that concludes the formal meeting. To, uh, how about our two Zoom uh, members? Any committee reports? All right then. Uh, so this concludes the formal meeting, and we will now read into closed session, Mrs. Anderson. I move that the school board recess into closed session to deliberate on the following matters. One, a closed meeting pursuant to the exemptions from open meetings allowed by Section 2.2-3711, Part A, Paragraphs 7 and 8, as amended. A7, consultation with legal counsel and briefings by staff members or consultants pertaining to actual or probable litigation where such consultation or briefing in open meeting would adversely affect the negotiating or litigating posture of the public body. For the purposes of this subdivision, probable litigation means litigation that has been specifically threatened or on which the public body or its legal counsel has a reasonable basis to believe will be commenced by or against a known party. Nothing in this subdivision shall be construed to permit the closure of a meeting merely because an attorney representing the public body is in attendance or is consulted on a matter and A8, consult consultation with legal counsel employed or retained by a public body regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel. Nothing in this sub subdivision shall be construed to permit the closure of a meeting merely because an attorney representing the public body is in attendance or is consulted on a matter, namely to discuss, number one, status of an investigation. Is there a second? Is there a second? Mrs. Riggs, all in favor, show a raised hand. Mrs. Felton, we need. Okay. Well, we have seven. Um, Mrs. Holtz, how do you vote? Go. So we have eight eyes to go into closed. We we've reconvened to read out of closed session, Mrs. Anderson. Whereas the school board of the city of Virginia Beach has convened a closed meeting on this date pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act and whereas section 2.2-3712D of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by this school board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now, therefore, be it resolved 
that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certification applies. And to only public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered. Uh, a motion, please. Mrs. Riggs, a second. Mrs. Manning, all in favor, show a raised hand. We have nine ayes. The motion passed. Thank you all. Uh, we are adjourned. Safe travels home.